So similar things happening in the project environment. So I want you to look at this and tell me what are you seeing? Just let's spend one minute working on that. Yeah, one-sided communication. Well, well, by the way, when you make it one-sided, is it a communication? Right? One-sided is not really communication. Communication is two ways. So let's look at this one. Why do we care about that in, in project management? What are you seeing in this? So let's just digest for a minute, okay? So that's, I, I want to start from here, from this one. What the customer really wanted, right? Projects always start with a customer request. Customer wants you to do something and you start doing it, right? And then what the customer needed, that's their need, what we call, right? And then they explain, we tell them, hey, can you explain it to us? So we switch from this to that, right? And then we say, that's how the customer explained it to us. Wait, wait a minute. There's a tire over here, right? And they are not explaining the same thing they, they need. How come? Like, that's strange, right? They need something, but they explain us differently. That's with the customer, right? Customer is always wrong, right? No, customer is always right angle. <laughs> so how the customer explain it, how the project leader understood it. So, well, they are already explaining it wrong, but even what they explained, we understand it wrong, right? And then, and then we hand it over to analysts that say, in this in this uh, dom in this course, I guess everybody, most of the people are uh, like some kind of programming and stuff. So how the analyst and then how they explain it to programmer? Look, now analyst understanding like that. Programmer is doing this the the swing, and then the business consultant. I don't I don't think we have any here, do we? And they are like polishing the product, and you know advertising and marketing it really well well the product is over here right that's how they advertise and then look the project documentation what do we have here nothing when next time we want to do the project a smart people a smart team member will ask wait a minute we do this project every year what did we do last year and there's no last year documented or it's something you repeat every two, three years, nothing is documented. Does this come familiar? Yeah. And then how the operations install it, that's fine. And that's another funny one, like the healthcare system. That's how you build. Well, you walked into our hospital, that's a hundred dollar. A nurse greeted you at five hundred dollar. You lay it on the bed, it's one thousand dollar. Okay. You use the restroom fifty dollar. That's how they build, right? Like a, like a roller coaster. And there was this incredible coaster, which was exactly like that. That's how they build us, right? And what is the support from the upper management? There is no support. They want to kill your project, right? They always say, we don't have money. We don't have time. Let's kill it, right? But you have this emotional attachment with your project. And you don't want to kill it, right? And some of the time they will think, hey, there's right angle and there's left angle, right? Well, that's kind of funny, but they will not have your expertise most of the time. Well, some high-tech, uh, high-heavy, high-tech-heavy companies like, you know, of course, Google, Apple, and uh, stuff like that, they, they want to promote the technology person to the management position. That's what I see more and more, like... If, if there's a core competency in the business, they just don't want to like have an MBA on it. They want to have someone like you guys, like coming from engineering department, engineering education, right? Maybe with an engineering master's degree and then put them in a, in a management level, leadership level of the company. That's, that's the trend mostly, not only an MBA, right? But anyway, most of the time, uh, no support. And let's not forget where we came from. We came from this. So customer needed this. 
I don't really blame them. They described it like this to us. But I blame everything in between. Okay? I, I never blame the customer. I blame everything else. Let's talk about this for a few minutes. Why the customer is um, really not being able to explain what they needed. Let's see, programmers. Why they can't just explain this tire or tire swing to us, but do this? Forget a need described as you wanted as a biomedical engineer, as a computer scientist, computer engineer, industrial engineer, any engineer. Nobody will be able to describe what they need as they need it and how they need it. And there's a lot of reasons. They don't know the root causes like Jacob said. They don't they don't know. They don't know the technology. Right? We can't really blame them. But we want to probe questions, make surveys, approach them from different angles, maybe one survey, one face to face meeting, one on site visit, right? To the hospital just looking at the patient and hospital uh, the doctor relation and how is this how is that process in the hospital maybe go a site visit right uh and then observe yourself what can be the need and then combining all these different angles now you can melt them in a pot and then say doctor is that probably close to what you needed and probably they'll say yes, because after this work, all this work, you will be able to nail it down. Sometimes we do this, like customers say something, and then we try to do it, and then uh, they say, oh, I, I really didn't mean that. Well, that's exactly what you said. Well, I said it, but that's really not what I needed. Customer is fine, right? We are the ones spending the money, effort, all these hours on the product. And if we come up with the wrong product, that's bad. So we need, really need to approach the customer from different angles, try to understand what they need physically and in their mind. Sometimes they just wish to have something, right? So that's also legitimate too. Well, I'm, I'm coming from military background, as you all know. I would like to have a flying tank. Well, I can wish it for it, but I don't know if any company will do it, but I can wish for it, right? Okay, so need is like, I think Dr. Jared also mentioned this in the, in the introduction last week. Need is that, that's all starts there, need. But sometimes, we don't know what we need really and how the technology meets our needs. That's, that's the job of the company again, anyways, like this part to find out what you really need, what they really need and how do you meet? Sometimes they need more things that need, than need it. And you can say, look, if we do this, that's a lot of money. But I think if you, if we do this much, we will still suffice your need and it'll be cheaper. So try to make the customer successful, not, not, be, not be, do not be a pleaser. Whenever customer says something, yes, we'll do it. Yes, we'll do it. Well, that's not the case always, right? The customer will like you if you are in a consultant, you know, manufacturing, serving them. They will be happy if you make them successful, if you make successful products. Okay. Any questions, any contributions about that? These are all, of course, the yellow part is the internal, internal communication like in the video. So we can talk hours about it. But one thing I want you to remember here, don't blame the customer and use probing questions, use different angles like surveys and everything <clears throat> to come up with really how to meet their need and understand their need. That's that's the takeaway from this slide. Contributions? Okay, let me look at the chat for a minute. If I missed anything there, they don't they don't have the yeah they don't have the language to understand yeah the technology they are not up to date. Customers know the result they want to see, but they're not clear with the exact 
Exactly. That's why I wasn't in, I wasn't a training how many I said you should sell solutions. You should sell solutions. Nowadays customers don't want products. We don't want products. We want solutions. Right? That's very different than product and and I think what Wang yeah, Wang wrote exact solutions. That's what I, what triggered me. <clears throat> Wang, thank you for writing this. So companies should sell solutions and solutions to exactly like Meng said solutions to customer needs if you just sell a product that's not that's not really solution especially for software companies right for software company you have to tailor your your solutions tailor to the companies or or customers whoever this customer and and I said I'm not going to tell the name but I said okay what is your company name and they said this this and this you see the solutions are in your name and you don't know it so the company name is like this x x y c or x s z and s is solutions right I, oh they were really surprised oh my goodness we have solutions in our title and we don't think about it yeah we, we usually don't think about it some smart guy when they established the company they they said we need to sell solutions, but it's it's forgotten, right? So we gotta sell solutions, guys. All right. <clears throat> Hopefully, a good discussion so far. Thanks for the contribution. So, what's definition project, right? So, a temporary endeavor undertaken to create a unique product, service, or result, right? So that's project definition from Pemba Guide. If you are want to be PMP certified, which is kind of a little bit expensive, I think it's uh, around 500. I don't know if any recent takers PMP examination. It's around 400, 500 uh, certification. Uh, they have a PEMBA guide that you need to study, and most most of my uh, citations or slides come from there when when there's a definition or something like that. So it's a temporary endeavor undertaken to create a product, service, or result. Right, so I want to. I don't want to memorize this. I don't want you to memorize this. But let's analyze this. So it says it's a temporary. It's to create, and it says unique product, service, and result. So everything, every word here means something. Okay. Sometimes we really pass fast the definitions, but definitions contain a lot of good information. So it says temporary. What do you understand? Well, temporary means you have a starting date and an end date. It it shouldn't go forever, right? That's number one. It says to create. It it's not saying to repeat, right? It's not saying to repeat, right? It should be unique. It's also not saying create the same product right and it's it's not only saying product it's saying also service or any result like i said solution okay so and this is uh this is not permanent right so do you understand how much info good information is in the definition so that's project. So it ends, right? All projects ends. And it can be large or small. So sometimes we think that if the budget is a thousand dollar, that shouldn't be a project. No, that's still a project. Right? It's a still a project. It just has a small budget. Ten thousand dollar, twenty thousand dollar. It doesn't have to be one million dollar project it doesn't have to be like a big construction project highway building a highway or anything like that it doesn't have to be that it can be long time it can take long or short okay to complete it and it's not a routine operation which means it shouldn't be a repetitive operations okay so based on this who is working in a project environment who is creating a temporary something uh, to create a unique solution? 
Well, I'm asking this, but I really don't know, like, how many of us employed. Like, is everybody student or recent grad? I, I don't know. So let's see. Anyone working in a company right now? One. Okay, at least one. Okay, two, three, four, five. Okay, so maybe 10. So it's not really a lot. Okay, it's just 10%. Okay. So because the reason is I always, I will, I will always ask questions like, what is your experience in your company? And well, if you don't, if you never work somewhere, of course, you don't have that experience. Okay. I'm a career changer. Deborah, I need to see you. Career changer. Then you will, you will need soft skills, right? Okay, so that's the project definition. So some common things are uh, temporary and unique. Okay, temporary and unique. You can read those. So examples. In, are you specializing in something? Okay, excellent. So some examples. Give me some examples of project. Is this is building this a project? Basically, two things. Did this thing have a budget? Was this thing a repetition of something? And was this thing had it? <clears throat> was it temporary? Right. That's the things that we want to look at it, which works for pyramids. How about <clears throat> how about a bridge? Like we have ten people. That's a project too. Okay. Now, writing an app is that a project for? Programmers. It's a project too. Yeah. It's a project. How about teaching a class? It's a project as well. And one of the comments, Jacob, repeating that project, I mean, lecture <clears throat> or course, let's say, it's, some might think it's a, it's a project. Um, it's not a project, it's a routine activity, but it's not. First of all, students change. <clears throat> my my schedule changes. Time changes. So content changes. Right? It's we don't want to change it a lot, like make it a different course because we want continuity. Uh but uh assignments change, right? Exam questions change. So it's it's a project as well. How about taking a course? Can you think of it as a project, like being a student in a course? It has a specific ending. Uh, there's deliverables in the project, right? There's assignments, there are quizzes, and when professors enters, these are all examples. So why I have this slide? So don't think if you are working on the computer, it's not a project. It doesn't have to be a construction. Don't think that if you are doing the for example you are let's say planning a conference every year that's a project let's say you are planning a visit to china every year for your company that's a project it's it yeah it's every year but it doesn't mean repetition repetition means like if you are in the company and doing the same thing every day right you're a car manufacturing factory and you're installing the tires and screwing it that's not a project you're doing everything, every, the same thing every day, right? That's a repetitive task. In the projects, there may be repetitive actions and processes, but that doesn't mean that it's not a project, okay? So you're in, installing tires and screwing them. That's not a project. All right. So project management, you can just... Uh, I read those, but what I want to emphasize is there is that your target is as a project manager is really you are juggling three things. You're trying to balance three things, which are basically time, cost, and scope. Time, cost, and scope. You are trying to juggle all these things, and your your target is not on one of these axes targets are, are not one of these axes your target is three-dimensional really so you want to be balancing scope cost and time let's say you prepared an exam really well 
couldn't take the test. So you were late in the schedule. Well, then that's not success, right? You have to work hard and you have to be on time. So it's similar to project management. You have to meet all the scope of your customer, which was the tire hanging on a tree. That was the, you know, scope. Kind of a scope, not really, but yeah, scope at, at the end of the day. And you have a budget to work in. And then you have a time to deliver your deliverables. Okay. So what is it not? Uh, the only thing I want to say here is sometimes when I see like companies say, hey, you know what? We have a new project management software like Monday.com or anything like that, right? Microsoft Office, Primavera. That's not the that's not the solution. Project management is also in your mind. It's a habit. It's a culture in the business. Just downloading one software is one step, but it's not going to solve all your pro project management problems. Sometimes companies hire a project manager and think that the entire company will be a better project management. No, it'll take time. It's a culture. So you need to work on culture and methods and skills and understanding of the people okay so project manager is the so you work with everyone with the customer your boss stakeholders anyone that that, that has a that has a say in your project so really your success project success lies over here It's not only the users, right? Of course, we are meeting the need of the user, right? Yeah, of course, that's right. But to do that, you are working with your business and maybe other businesses as well, and your suppliers too. So you have all these complex components and supply chain going on, and your project lies, if, if you can juggle all these things, that's what they look for. Okay? If you have a good company, but very good customer portfolio but you couldn't really agree with suppliers like what to supply when to supply if you are failing that part the project is not successful okay <clears throat> so it's not only customer i want to say everything starts with the customer but to meet the need of the customer there's a, a lot of other things going what i want to mention here is so there's an enter phase and start phase and i always like to uh, draw so there's an enter start phase okay so that's so when you look at the pmp uh, again if you are going to certification you will see there's a uh, initiation phase mentioned planning phase execution closing uh, monitoring and control and also exit entering phase is not really mentioned really project starts with initiation right and then when you initiate the project, you start planning the details. Well, first, rough planning, right? General planning, and then you detail your planning. And then you plan and then execute this plan. And then you plan again and then execute this plan. Plan again, execute this plan. If you remember from the soft skills, I said, you know what? We execute it. And then as you execute it, you will need some more planning. And, and as you go through the project phases, you have to plan in detail and execute in more details. So it's a repetitive process here. And then when you are done with all the deliverables, you close it and then uh, exit out. Okay. So for example, the initiation, let's, let's talk about this course. Okay. The initiation of this course, the initiation, let me raise this. And we, we kind of talk about what we need to do and stuff. Uh, and then initiation project, initiation phase really started like when we make our canvas on, when we try to recruit some graders, right? All these things, also a project. And we plan the process. Okay, what time we should do it, which dates, which day of the week we should do it, what should we teach it and everything, right? And then exit and then as we go we will plan more and then we will close it when you have 
when you have your quizzes done, assignments graded, you know, after how many weeks, I don't know. And then we'll exit out. We we'll close it. You'll be gone. Like, you'll be gone here. But we still have exit phase, which what I'm going to do is I'm going to document everything, what I taught, all the assignments, right? All the grades for further reference. I'm going to put them in a, in a folder or print them out. That's my exit phase. Got the point? So that's how to manage a project. And, and your, one thing I wanted to realize is monitoring and controlling phase. This whole blue thing, like a base, is monitoring and controlling. As we go, we monitor and control everything, right? Some of you couldn't join the Zoom link. Some couldn't register. We tried to solve it. Some couldn't find the password. It's right next to the link, but they couldn't find it somehow. They just clicked it and wanted to see the link, uh, password. So everything going on, we need to monitor and control. Some of you will be working away, traveling away from this course. A lot of stuff. That's why the monitoring and control is like based to everything that we're doing. Monitoring. So as a project manager, I guess you will be the the majority of your time is going to go for monitoring and controlling and planning because execution probably will be some other people other teams but as a project manager you will be planning and monitoring and controlling okay that's uh, the things that i want to emphasize Okay, so triple constraint time, time cost requirements. Have you heard this before? I, I want to say this as, remember this as TSC, time, scope, and cost. For example, this may come up as a quiz question, which you don't really like study anything. Yeah, iron triangle, triangle yeah, they call it iron triangle, TSC. But uh, <clears throat> some people will also call it like for time, you will also hear as schedule and cost. You will also hear as budget. And for requirements, you'll, you'll also see scope. So we will talk next week about, start about scope, right? So what did the customer talk us, uh, tell us about this tire? And how do we get his narrative and then turn it into a scope so we can work towards the scope? That's what they're going to do next week. Okay. So this is again, you have to juggle these three things really well, right? Nobody likes a project management who used less money, who met the scope, but couldn't deliver on time, maybe six months late. Well, saying that, to be honest, most of the projects are late and we will talk about it. Almost there is no project, you know, big projects delivered on time. It's, uh, it's not really common. We, all, we are always late. Well, if you are late, what do you, hmm. so just one comment about being late. If you are late, you know, we will learn about tools and techniques, but if I am the employer, if a project manager is late, let's say it's a five-year project, right? And then if, if project manager thinks it's late the fifth year and tells me we're going to be another two years late, that's not good. But we will learn about some tools and techniques that you can say your employer sponsor in the second year or third year, maybe you can say, we're going to be late. So we need to do something now, right? <clears throat> so it's not only being late, being late is fine, but it's more important. Well, not fine, but most of the time acceptable because they don't have another choice because you put all this money and investment in there. Uh, but you got to tell them like early enough, as early as possible to be able to mitigate the risks. Okay. So th this is, there's also extended constraint and risk is one of them, which we will cover and communication we will be covering in soft skills a lot. Quality is one of them. I will not get into quality probably. Satisfaction is another one. So it's not only time, scope and cost. There's other things as well that, project management should be taken care of. So as you can see, you can see the <clears throat> step and some of the highlights 
<clears throat> for a project management here. I hope you will have your team say that I'm going to come with you. I'm going to, you know, follow you and hopefully you can be good leaders. So there are also program managers, right? I want you to read that one, but I want to like talk about this hierarchy. We have seven minutes. So project management, right? So at the very lowest level, we have project managers and one, one above them, there's program managers. And then one above them, portfolio managers, right? Portfolio. I'm saying this kind of a hierarchy because sometimes you will see projects with no program manager. Sometimes you will see program managers with no project managers under them. Okay. That's why you don't see this. It's not a rigid thing, but if there is, it'll be portfolio, program, and project. Right. For example, <clears throat> when, when Dr. Jarrett was this, uh, describing this, right. And then his kind of program manager, which, ha which has more perspective, more, he needs to contact more with other sponsors, uh, project, uh, the companies and try to understand which project is better for which one of you. You see? So my role is kind of limited to this. It's not good or bad or being higher level or lower level, but my role is project management for this one as this one and maybe some other projects going on as well. Right? That's the hierarchy. And and what I was saying is, you know, you will see some projects sometimes. Let me see. You will see projects uh, that are connected to programs. And then, so every program, there's a few projects, more than one. And every portfolio, there's more than one programs. But sometimes you will have projects that are connected to portfolio manager. There's no program manager in between. And there may be some reasons for those, like if they have really, really big budget, right? If you want to eliminate the <clears throat> bureaucracy a little bit, so you don't really put a program manager in between the portfolio manager. If it needs close attention, right? If it needs close attention, you don't want a program manager in between, between portfolio manager and project manager, right? If it's really long term, right? Then it may be just a loan project connected to portfolio. Okay. And you can differentiate projects and programs. Just quickly in five minutes, projects have deliverables. It has started, for example, nine months, there's times that we meet. There is like last time that you can attend. <clears throat> Benefits realized during the project, like you're learning and contributing during the project, like when we teach. It's shorter time scale, right? It's driven by state vision of end state. Okay. In this epics program, what do we want to do? Right. Or more beneficial to students, right? There's no predefined path. So think about it. My role as a project manager. Let's say we don't have a set time to meet. It always changes. We don't know what the assignments are. We don't have a canvas site. That's bad, right? That's not a good project management. But in program management, you may have this kind of stuff like no predefined path because the changes, it, it depends on business capability. If, if students request something and it has a longer time scale. Okay. So this is kind of a difference between project and programs. Let's see what I have left. I have only two minutes. Yeah, you will spend your time on planning and monitoring and controlling the more for you to learn. So work breakdown structure. I will just make a one minute introduction <clears throat> and next time we will start. So whatever you want to do in the, in your project, <clears throat> you want to break them down to parts and sections and phases, right? It depends on what you want to do. So you kind of think about your project. And what's the major subsystem of the project, the task, the subtask, and the work package and activities. We'll talk about those. If you're not familiar with WBS, uh, it'll be a great learning. And there's indented version. Like in one project, what is the major subsystem and what's the task? So these, these numbers are unique, right? So this is 111, this is 112. 
let's look at this one 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 two one one two this is one 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 two so it's unique numbering is happening here okay and that <clears throat> you can also you probably see it this way which is graphical most of the time you will see wbs as graphical okay and <clears throat> And uh, just one more thing before you go, think about how does project manager define scope and resources? So how do you get that this customer need and make them tell us <clears throat> their story and their need? And how can we define that our scope and resources so we can accomplish the project well? We will talk about it next time. Thank you so much. We are right on time. <clears throat> so any questions? <clears throat> Today, I I try to always make a quick, quick, quick review. If I don't forget before every every other lecture, I I do some quick review. We're gonna think about planning today and requirements and statement of work, which is kind of the formal phrase used in PMP for uh, the things that most of you said. Okay, and then scope also used a lot and WBS. Okay, today's topic. So I want you to use this in your uh, personal and academic uh, briefings, uh, presentations, discussions, okay? That's one kind of a review. What are some common themes in, in project management, right? So projects are temporary, they are unique, right? They have a beginning and an end. If you are, if you are going to the factory and you're just installing the tires, like I said, and then screwing all the screwdrivers using screwdrivers to screw all the you know screws then it's not a project it's you it's a routine that you're working okay it can be a part of the project but what you're doing just installing the tires is not a project okay so they should be unique uh what's the triple constraints you can write in the chat does anyone remember what was the triple constraints? Let's see. How did I? Uh, yeah. What was the acronym that I used? Did you do you remember? Yes, TSC. Thank you, Ariel. Yeah. I want you to remember TSC. Okay. So TSC is my acronym. Time, scope, cost. For cost, we also call it budget. Some other some references will call it budget. Some will say schedule instead of time. Okay. Requirements, they say scope. So they are all the same things. Okay. And your budget will be the function of scope, schedule, and also budget too. So what does that mean? Like budget is a function of scope and schedule. Maybe I should take out the budget, but next time. What does it mean budget is scope and schedule function? Quality chairs? Do you want like, most of our classroom has like Zoom recordings right now, right? During the COVID-19. Before that, we have a few, but now almost almost all the classroom has Zoom Zoom recording capability. And maybe more than half has the camera you know we can record students video and voice the schedule how does it affect the budget how, how come the schedule affect the budget then yes. it's more expensive right it's yes. more expensive because you have to hire more workers double the workers because you want to complete it faster right yes. you got to make them work harder like longer uh, so you you it it costs you more yeah, for expedited work, even with USPS, right? I was mailing an envelope yesterday and they said, if you wanted to get that tomorrow, you got to give me $25. Well, it was in Phoenix, right? So expedited, always called, it's the same for projects. All right. So I also want, I also, I was happy hearing like students said, initiation, planning. I, I really wanted to hear that. And interface, one of the things you want to do is what happened in the previous projects, right? 
to you you want to go back to like previous projects and and get the lessons learned from there right that's one thing you that you should do for everything what happened next year last year how was the conference last year what did the contractor do last year or you can even call the contractor and say hey this year view on the contract what went wrong yesterday i mean last year with you right one time they all, they paid us our money uh, they were always good like they give us free lunch whatever right so you can get the previous experience never underestimate that that never underestimate that okay always start with lessons learned <clears throat> all right so I, I i wanted to hear these and some of you already mentioned those really good so pm process so then you need to plan the project it's it may be as easy as furnishing a classroom like in your assignments you should plan the project right and you have to use this process in your project so we will talk about the planning today why don't we start with a kickoff meeting right so many of you said i would go to the if there's any if there's any previous work projects done i would like to see them maybe you have you already have a team of course right you have your own employees uh so why don't you you know start with a kickoff meeting and sometimes you need to because you will not be able to agree because not everyone will be there so perhaps you need a second one as well so here just everybody talks about what they what they need what they want their expectations and then they agree on what to do okay so it's always good to start with a kickoff meeting we don't like planning if i if i may talk on behalf of you guys okay planning takes time it requires thinking right uh it involves paper paperwork you know uh like ahmed said they want to document everything so documenting means basically you're just documenting every idea every design and you are basically like self-imposing some limitation on your team right and you have to plan systematically for example you have to use the project management steps right so we really don't like planning but we have to be in the planning process as an engineer okay to able to understand better the objectives what is the objective right what's the objective that's why in the beginning the first session i always said here are the expectations what you should expect from my soft skills lectures here is what you should expect in my project management lectures reduce the uncertainty right so efficiency monitoring control responsibility and accountability what is the need area for each team right for that you gotta gather the need area right we have to be involved so as engineers i know you know you like to sit in sit on your desk and then get your computer and code until the morning but that's not what you should do you have to get involved in the planning process okay engineers uh, the other the other domains wants engineer to be in the planning process as well because engineering costs money and I want you to be involved in the in the planning process as well. Don't just say, "Hey, you know, just tell me what do I need to do and I'll do it." Right? That's not that's not an approach that we should we should, you know, get. So we should be in the planning process. You can read this uh, I'm including this just for your uh, information. It should be explicit, intelligible, flexible. Remember what I told you about the military, they are good at planning. They are even better at updating the plan so you sh your plan should be flexible right should be ex should be able to change not fragile for example during COVID 19 uh yeah some universities just closed down their uh physical students and then they completely went online because they couldn't like adapt the change but what we so you should be flexible and yeah can us requirements so there are statement of work and scope and schedule which we will cover next week and wbs okay work breakdown structure so here's my question to you could you you started your project and you are 
you are creating the classroom you, you started putting some physical work in it not only like post-its on the wall and then uh you started ex executing some of the physical stuff uh and then customer comes back to you and says uh let's pick one uh let's say wang right wang uh could you just quickly add this feature to the product as well right whether it be a shopping cart a classroom furnishing what would you say Wang? would you just say yes, yes because they are your customer or would you say a big no because you started execution let's see what would you say so there's a reality the customer is coming to you regardless of what phase how much money you spend into the project and they are asking you they are customer right they can ask right what you have you should always say that we understand your concerns what do you mean by this right like meng wen said maybe they want to add something but what they want to achieve is something else remember the tire they needed a tire but they explained us differently and then we understood differently so maybe they want to add a feature, but they really want to ex accomplish something else, right? So that's one. The second one, something may, be, may seem easy to you as a project manager, but we don't have the expertise for toothpaste and the space shuttle and then the shopping carts and then the furnishing a classroom, right? We can't be expert in everything. So even though it looks simple to you all, you should say, I want to ask my team okay so that's two things i want you to say so not a yes not a no no what you want to say is it it does not depend this is this is what i want you to say give me a few days or weeks right whatever is needed i'll get back to you let me talk to my team but before that even you want to ask what do you want with this feature what, what do you what do you mean with this feature do you mean that and do you mean that and most of the time, Meng Wang, you will under, you will see that they don't even know what they're saying because it's possible that in a, in their own meeting, somebody said something and she, she or he didn't really understand their manager. And then they just, they're just asking you, like, just because they feel responsible and they want to ask. When, when you ask some questions, do you mean that? Do you mean this? Do you realize that this feature will block that feature? And then uh, they will say, oh, no, I, I really don't know these details. Let me go to my team and really see what we want, right? There you go. That's your job. Well, now there's the question. What do you think the customer will feel about your response? Let's continue with someone else who wants to volunteer. So people, because customer wants yes or no, right? Customer is always right. Is it? Are they? So what would they feel about it? What would they feel about it? They want to hear a yes, right? Or maybe they want to they want to hear a clear no. Well, I think the customer will feel okay. They will feel better than your yes and no most of the time because uh first of all you make them aware that they even don't know what they're asking, right? So that's a big revelation for them. Next time when they come to you, they will be more careful, more detailed, will do their homework. The second, if you, if you think something is simple and say yes, right? And then you go back to your team and they say, hey, this requires another 10,000 or we can't really do this because there's some federal regulations that are saying, I don't know, you know, customer database should be protected or whatever, whatever. Uh, and then you can't do it. And then now, a few weeks later, you went back to customer and say, you know what? I said yes, but I apologize. We can't do it because of these federal regulations. That's worse than saying, let me consult my team. Let's see what we can do. Okay. I really don't want you to, to say, to pronounce yes. And I don't want you to pronounce no, because if you say yes, the customer will not hear what you add later, 
they will only remember yes. If you say no and then say something, they will only remember no. So don't pronounce yes and no. Just say, I understand your concerns. Let me go back to your team. Because if you say yes and then say, but this requires this and that, they will only hear yes. Okay? So don't pronounce yes and no, no, please. Okay, let's go to chat. Yeah, let's go. So it really depends on like, what I want you to do is actively listen. What is the request? What type of project are you in? Are you building a skyscraper or you're just building a website, right? Because it really depends. Some, th some things are physical, some things are not. So they cannot just add one more one more uh, flat to the to the building, right? On one more floor to the building because there may be some uh, civic code. But you can add a search engine into the website or whatever, right? Maybe it's easier. Uh, what phase are you in? If you are almost delivering the website, you can say, you know what? That can be a, a good add-on to the next cycle or something, right? If you are doing the Scrum project management, like the agile project management, right? It's always iterative, so you can add more features. You can say, oh, maybe that's good for the next cycle, right? Not not for this one, right? Because you are almost about to deliver. Is it achievable within the timeline, right? What do you need extra? You know, if you say yes to customer and then go back and say, this requires a 10,000, and then the customer will say, Oh, no, because you said yes, I thought you could do it, right? But if you come back without saying yes, if you come back a few days later and say, here's the thing, I work with my team, we studied this, and then we need another month, and we need another 10,000. If you can do that, if you can provide us this, if you agree on this, we can do it. Then the customer will say, yeah, go ahead, yeah, we'll do it. And then they will be more happy, happier, yeah? Understand what I mean? So they will like such project managers better. By the way, can your team accomplish it? Maybe you need to hire an external expertise for that, external vendor, right? So you gotta, you gotta look at all these different aspects. We look at any business value, and this brings me to the Meng Wang's first comment, right? They may say, tell us something, but is it adding a value? Uh, do they really mean what they say or they mean something else, right? That's our job as a project manager to understand what they want. Okay? Because uh, some just apply to a project manager. <laughs> so, for example, I just want to pick production, right? If we tell the production team their aim is lowest cost, right? If If you want them to... Uh, design a missile, they will produce the lowest cost, but then it would look like this and it wouldn't work for us, right? So we should just combine all this perspective, respect all these perspectives and combine them and do our own analysis, like, like the ideal. Every one looked at the safety, one looked at the cost, one looked at the convenience of shopping, and then they combined the best solution in all of them and combine them in one prototype, right? So never let it to any of the stakeholders like Ricky said, right? Well, if yeah. I... It, when it comes to statement of work, like, it's really important, right? So he asked for the slides, doesn't get it, the printer is off, right? All these guys, IT. Well, every time we call someone, they say, our menu change, right? No one says, we have the same menu, so... Just choose it. No one, no one says that. They always say, our menu has recently changed. So statement of work, anything that's not clear works for the customer because customer is always right, right? So, and what is the purpose, right? What is the purpose to be achieved? What is the exclusions? What shouldn't be done, right? That's one thing that I want to see in the statement of works as well. We usually focus on what we will do, but we don't really say what we want to. You should start doing this. You should include the things that you will not do to eliminate any assumptions. Like I said, if the customers hear yes, she will not hear anything else you said. If they hear no, they will not hear anything else you said. So you want to be clear that 
I'm not going to paint the ceilings, right? Ceilings are excluded from painting, which when you write this, you are, okay, if they want it painted, they will tell us now because they saw it. Otherwise, they will just assume that, hey, we told them to paint the classroom. Of course, ceiling is a part of the classroom. They're going to paint it. We assumed such. But it's not always the case, right? It's not always the case. So exclusions, I want to hear the exclusions. I want to read exclusions. Quantities, how many? Do I have one classroom, five classroom, ten classroom? Is all classrooms or some are, is there any, are they all the same? Or do I have to do something? Like, do they have all the windows, all the doors, right? What are the quantities? What is the schedule? You want to say the schedule as well. Furnishing the classroom will be completed by this day, right? Deliverables, what are the deliverables? Because you cannot just deliver the whole project. You should you should deliver it in chunks, right? So what is the deliverables and what are the time for the deliverables? What's the acceptance criteria? What's the acceptance criteria, right? So how are you going to hand over the classroom? Is the project manager office, somebody from there will come and accept it? Uh, I don't know, maybe the case is, we want the first lecture to be taught, and then we want to get the feedback from professors and customers, and then once you apply those feedback, we're going to accept the project. Can you write that? Yeah. Right? You, you may write that as well. So you got to, what is the acceptance criteria? Okay. And responsibility, who's going to do what? These are all parts of the s statement of work. If you can't agree goals and objectives, that's a problem area. Everyone should be able to uh, agree. That's why exclusions are important because it eliminates the assumptions. Maybe the, uh, yeah, reduces the assumptions, let's say. So you should be able to change the uh, objectives as well. There should be sufficient time to do it. Anything that's not adequately quantified and not documented works for the customer. Customers is always right. If something is vague, unclear, undefined, it'll work for the customer's benefit. Okay, so as a project manager, we want to make sure that everything is wrote, written in detail. For example, uh, you're going to paint the walls, right? But what color? You, you, Or maybe some other thing because of the purpose of that classroom. Maybe it's a psychology classroom or whatever, right? They will use some other other specific color for that. Okay? So you, just saying painting the walls is not enough. Okay? Uh, when there's a personal turnover, it's high. That's a problem as well. Right? For example, McDonald's. Every time you go drive through, there's a different person probably because turnover rate is really high. So if this is happening in that company, or your company as a contractor, that's a big problem because people will bring the information, just bring the information with them and leave the company. If they didn't document somewhere in Google Drive, some you know papers, folders, it's going to be lost. And sometimes people change in the, like that. if project management office manager change, you got to make sure to contact her again and maybe make a meeting and update her about your project because there will be hundreds of projects she's handling and you want to make sure that she knows yours, right? She's She has the up-to-date latest information about yours. So when personnel turnover is high, be careful about your stakeholders and who changed, okay? You can read those, let's see, scope. Scope is the basically uh, project description, again, acceptance criteria, project deliverables, what is excluded, what's the constraint? You can say the budget of the furnishing classroom is we're looking around 20000 right? you got to say that in the statement of work. You can change it later if needed, but both parties should agree. What's the applicable engineering standards? You know, there will be screens, there will be power. So is there any electrical engineering uh, federal regulations for those things, right? So you got to make sure to build that. Uh, and please, please, please get it signed, get it documented. 
Sometimes your boss will be traveling to China, to India. He will come back two weeks later, whatever. Make sure he knows it and signs it. If they, if they don't sign it, when months pass and years pass, they will say, I don't know about that project. Well, you will say, you signed it. And he will say, I don't remember signing it. Let's look at it. And then you'll open it up. And really, there is no signature. Okay, so without signing, nothing is official, almost, right? Especially project baseline, like scope, statement of work, and all of these things. Okay, let's cover the work breakdown structure in five minutes and then uh, call it a day. So work breakdown structure. In the beginning, I think it was Rakar said, I would uh, divide it to chunks and, and do it one by one, right? So that's, that's that. It's a deliverable oriented hierarchical decomposition. So it's deliverable oriented work breakdown structure. There's a work, a big work, right? And how would you deliver this in a hierarchical decomposition? And that's work breakdown structure. Okay. Uh, it helps detail planning, cost and budget. You can associate a cost and budget for each deliverable. You can link it to objectives. Like we said in the beginning, if, if what, what is the part of the work breakdown structure that will meet that cause, right? And who's going to do which part? You can also assign those. And yeah, you can do those things. So this is helping. So, so that's what it looks like. Okay. So there's a main project. There's a major subsystem, task, subtask, and work package, and activities. So remember in the beginning I said, and last week as well, just installing a tire is not a project. But it can be a part of the project, which I meant it can be one of the activities in the project. Right? It can be one of the activities, which is a part of the work package. But it's not a project. Right? It's not a project. But it's a part of the project, like installing the tires, right? So that's the levels. There's a project, sub-project, tasks, and work packages and activities. For example, that's another way to show it. So this is called indented, okay? So it's a project. There's a sub-project or subsystem, which is 1011, right? And then task one is 111. So we give unique identifiable numbers to each of them. For example, this project has two major subsystems. One is, uh, wait, one, I guess one one has two tasks, 111 and the other one is 112. So it has also two subtasks. 1111 and then 1121. Why is it important to have the identifiable numbers? I want to, the reason is uh, the company share these numbers, like your finance guys, your pro contractor, everybody will share this number. And when we say 1121, the finance, the PMO, the contractor, everyone understands the same thing. Instead of saying that, uh, you know, how much do I have in the account that I'm furnishing the, for the implementation of the computers, especially for the screens? How much do I have? Right? They will say, okay, which classroom, which screen, what's happening? Instead of saying that, we're just going to say this, 112, 112. Can you check how much do I have left in 112, 112? And they'll just understand what you mean. That's why it's important, okay? That's why the, you can understand the cost. For example, for activities, because it's predictable, you can assign a cost. And then now you can add those up and then assign a cost for the work package and then bring all the work packages together and then assign a cost for the subtask. And then going backwards or upwards, you can estimate the rough budget for the project. Okay? Work breakdown is structure is help, uh, helping for that. You can also say, if that's an IT work package, you can say, okay, IT department, uh, John Abril will, will handle that. 
And if this is the furniture, furnishing the classroom, we can say Meng Wang will handle that, right? So that's that also makes your job easier and you can assign works to people. And you can estimate the cost and also duration. If this is taking 10 days, if this is taking five days, probably this work package is taking 15 days. If this is taking, the other one is also 15 days, probably that subtask is, uh, or the task one is taking 15 plus 15, 30 days, you understand? And then how many subtasks you have, probably your project will take 60 days. You can have a rough planning, okay? So it's really, really helpful for all these aspect, aspects, okay? And this is gonna be your assignment. But there's other forms. These are graphical. You will mostly see this one. Oh, it's 12, 16. It's okay, I'm wrapping up. You can also list like this one or show it graphical or as mind map, right? Mind map and waterfall too. Yeah, just one more thing. Think about to plan the remaining steps. So now you already did thought about the scope, statement of work, work breakdown structure. We talked about it. And now as a project manager, what should be your next step, right? Okay, so <clears throat> what I'll try to do is, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, let's see. As, as you already know, I always start with a few slides that's reminding you what we did before. And then uh, we will work, work on WBS. And then uh, some different examples, and we're gonna talk about why, which example helps in which situations. I'm gonna ask for your uh, feedback on that, and then I'll make an introduction to PERT. Uh, and then we will have hands-on activities, okay? Okay, so who can tell me one sentence about this? One sentence about this. If you can, miscommunication. Okay, miscommunication, accepted. What are the common themes about project management? Project definitions, there are, there are multiple project management definitions or project definitions, right? The temporary and unique is the common themes. All projects are temporary, all projects are unique, right? How about the triple constraints? What are the triple constraints? Time, scope, and budget. Yeah, in, in some places, in some references, you will see budget as cost, right? So I, I make, as you know, I make it as TSC. I think I told you this, right? That's how I remember it. TSC, time, scope, and cost. That's my acronym for that. I always study like this. I always find a way to remember things, especially if you are going to be certified. You, you want to use this in your life, in your professional life as well, right? So it's always good to remember these things. And these may come up in the quiz as well, okay? which we will talk about. Uh, there's also an extended, extended version of TSC, right? Can you, do you remember any of the extended version that project management needs to juggle, project manager needs to juggle them? There was an extended version as well. Do you remember any of those things? For example, risk is one of them, right? Quality, yes, thank you. Quality is one of them. Risk is one of them. Communication, one of them. Satisfaction of the customer, one of them. It's not really time, scope, and cost which will be so much easier for a project manager. But we have others as well, okay? So please review those slides before the quiz. You know the pro project management process, okay? So that was what I was talking about, Deborah, right? Uh, you will quickly find out, probably, because you now have the knowledge, you're gonna be, if you are in the closing phase, right? If they want you to close out, close it out or something, or maybe you are in the execution phase, the company is in the execution phase and they want you to do something related to UX or something, right? So you, you will quickly know which phase are you, or if they are hiring their project managers just now and trying to come up with the scope and, and you know, all these things, 
probably somewhere in the initiation projects, right? Initiation phase. So you'll quickly learn where you are and then uh, you'll get from there. Okay, good. This will also come up in the quiz. Uh, hierarchy, you know the hierarchy. Project management, program management, portfolio management is very important. So the lowest level is project management. It's not about like being superior to others, but like you report to them, right? Because uh, program managers has more projects and portfolio managers has like even more programs, right? But I also showed you this. Sometimes you will have, I always like my pencil. Project that has no program, which is directly connected to or reporting to portfolio. Sometimes you will have really formally structured like this one. You have three projects, you know, connected or reporting to the lower level program and then the higher level program and then the portfolio, right? Okay. So these may be the case. That's why I say kind of hierarchy. You will not exactly find this, like project, program, portfolio. Okay. What can you about can you say about this? Could you just quickly add this new feature or like uh yeah, requirements creep? What can you say? What is a good sentence if a customer comes up to you and, and say this? No matter which phase are you in, no matter which project are you doing. Never say yes, never say no, because whatever that you say after say yes and no, they will only remember yes and no, okay? The second thing, do not just say, I'm gonna ask my team. First, see, like Mian said, ask her, her him questions, and then uh, really try to understand if she knows what she's asking, right? Uh, if she knows what she's, maybe she will say, Oh, I don't, I don't really know. In our meeting, just one of the team members told me that, and then I wanted to ask you, well, you are asking me, but what do you mean, right? And then before you take the responsibility on your side, right, uh, because you ask some questions, of course, kindly, right, it, not criticizing or anything, but trying to help, but help, ask questions. Uh, and then she will say, okay, before you do anything, let me go back to my team and really ask and learn what do we want. And then she will come back to you and then you can say, oh, great, let me talk to my team and you know I'll get back to you next meeting, next week, tomorrow, whatever. Because when you are reiterating the same information, you may do typos, right? You may, but if you include a link, if you direct them to the real source, right? then they will see the correct information right there. So if you are, I put, and, and we'll cover this in the technical communication side of things, but don't repeat the same information in different means because if you do any typos, which happens, it will be your responsibility, right? So I always tell them, hey, that, okay? So that's my way of doing things after so many decades working with people. Don't let this happen to you. Who can tell one sentence about this one? So, how can you avoid this? Uh, yep. Communication, meetings. Communication. Scheduling after uh, actively listening to the other person, right? Yeah. These are all helps. And, and coming up with the scope and everybody signs the scope, right? And then everybody understands the same thing, hoping. Okay. Good. Very good. And the scope is, yeah, here. Look, this is very, very important. Signed and documented. Sometimes we forget to sign or get it signed. And sometimes we forget to document. I mean, who can easily find what happened last week, last year for the same conference, right? What was the final product? I mean, we have tens of versions of, of the same thing. Which one was the final one? Which did you edit the final one after your boss's input, right? All these things. It's not really easy documenting something, okay? So please make sure that you document it. Okay, work back down structure. So I showed you this one, which is uh, a very common one. 
it, it looks like an organizational chart as well. If you know a little bit of information like organizational management, you will clearly recognize this one. Uh, and it, the name is already org chart, right? So because it's it really looks like an org chart. Okay. Uh, so what happens is you're going to get your product, I mean project, which is in this case we are furnishing a classroom, right? That's our project. So uh, how can you organize your project? Right? That's WBS. In this case, it's a conference. So for a conference, what do you have? You have to have a venue, right? It's going to take place somewhere. What else do you have? Well, you have attendees, right? You have speakers. Someone will, will talk. There will be a keynote speaker. There will be like some famous people speaking, whatever. There will be students, members, industry speakers, academia speakers, right? Uh, there will be publicity. There will be flyers, printouts, websites, all these things, right? And you, there will be handouts like on the desks, on the tables. When people come, they will just get them. And then logistics, right? Logistics is a lot for a conference. So that's how you can organize it, right? You can organize, you can plan your conference thinking about different aspects and then for example in the let's let's pick one let's pick uh, uh speakers right let's pick speakers so who are my speaker options right who, who's gonna send my invitations right and who's gonna book the speakers is going to have somebody for the graduation speech right so in this conference who are we thinking as speaker, right? Options. So one team is going to formalize the options and bring it down to three maybe, right? And then you're going to send invitations. Somebody will send invitations because they will not all, all be available, right? And then somebody will confirm and book the speaker, right? They're going to talk to their front desk. They'll make sure they have the flight tickets. They have the room, right? Somebody needs to do all those things, right? And these are all actions. That's one way to do it, okay? There are others as well. This is a, what we call list, okay? Same thing, venue, attendees, speakers, publicity, publicity, handouts, logistics. There you go. Same thing, just a different picture, okay? Which one is good? Well, you can use both. Uh, but a mind map, how about a mind map? I use this a lot. So same thing, venue, attendee, speaker, publicity, handout, logistics. And of course, lessons learned, right? Previous conference materials, I love this. I always want to say this, previous conference, previous uh, classroom, uh, furnishing classroom, previous courses, previous whatever, right? Everything. This is a mind map. Okay, and this is waterfall. Same thing, just a different show. Let's see if I can find the things. Oh, this is difficult. Handouts, right? Previous conference, uh, speakers, and yeah, venue, right? All those things. Okay, so same things, just a different thing, Dif different picture. Okay, so which one would you prefer? Let's see. Which one do you use in your life, in your professional life or personal life? I use, especially the mind map, I use in my per, uh, personal life as well. Which one is uh, your favorite? Or maybe from now on, it's going to be your favorite. Yeah, You see how the communication really improved once I put the numbers, right? Yes. It, it, yeah, it's great. Uh, so number four, what is missing there, Ralph? Manager, and you gave this to me. You, I am one of the. There are multiple teams. I am one of the, one of the teams team member, right? Mm -hmm. I want to do the work. You gave this to me. Work breakdown structure. Is it clear what I should do? 
if you print this out and then put it on the wall, everyone will understand, right? But is is one of the multiple teams team member, right? Will I understand what will I need? Let's say, uh, let's say I am, um, I am the selected subject matter team member. What should I wait? It's not clear, right? Yeah. What's coming before me? What's going to come after me is not clear, right? I'm not saying it's good or bad. I also prefer list, but everything is missing something. So whatever is the most com com convenient for your company, for your project, product, you should choose that one. Good. What is difficult about number two? So we have the ingredients and we have the cooking instructions, right? So it's there is two things, ingredients and then cooking instructions, right? Number one, <clears throat> the good thing is you can change very easily. <clears throat> Sorry. <clears throat> you can edit it. You can add a eight one. Let's see. If I want to add, add an eight, right? Something here. It, it's really easy. It doesn't, I don't need to change the other stuff, right? But let's say I want to add something here, right? Oh my goodness. How am I going to add it? Like, if I want to add an eight, where am I going to add it, right? Because if I add, let's say here, but this all says arrows and precedence, right? This shows what's going to come next, what's going to come before, right? So I have to like, maybe I'm not doing like in reality, but maybe I have to erase this here and then new arrow here. And this will go all the way down here, right? And this will affect this. So I got to make this over here, right? Do you understand what I mean? You can't really change it. It's really hard to change it. So this is kind of the last process that you're going to hand it over to someone to the lowest level that's going to do the work. Once it's like really concrete, because remember, plans will be updated. So that's going to be really difficult to update this. It's a downsize, but this also works beautifully like, but it doesn't. It's just my writing here. Okay. It doesn't show a hierarchy. It doesn't show a sequential order. Okay. So it's just like whatever you think, you're just going to categorize your thoughts and about the venue, about the attendees. It's not showing me a hierarchy. If you want a hierarchy, not a hierarchy, but the precedence, right? It's number two. Number two shows it perfectly. Uh, so I kind of summarized, but I also had a caveat about one of you said, if you create multiple of these, I'm going to ban you doing that. Okay. Choose one. Okay. Well, on your desk as a project manager, do whatever you want. But now it's time to communicate it with others, share it with others. Please share only one of them. Okay. Maybe do this first, or maybe do this first, right? It's kind of a mind map. You're gathering your thoughts. You're clustering your thoughts. And maybe switch to this. And then finally get to this one. If it's like a step-by-step -step instructions for people to work, especially for crowded teams. But please, please, please don't share this one and this one with the wider audience. Please only share one thing, okay? Because if you share these ones, they will ask questions about those, but it's already updated. Uh, some of them will not see number two. They will still have number three. You know, all this confusion about miscommunication. Just share one thing, okay? I don't care what do you do on your desk as long as you don't share with the wide audience, okay? Okay, so these are the uh, downsizes. I don't want to say this is the best, right? Whichever works for you, in which case, just use it. Okay? All right, okay. So we worked, we talked already a lot about WBS. Uh, so you're going to subdivide, you know, the project deliverables, uh, smaller and more manageable chunks. 
to make it more understandable, right? Uh, it's kind of a hierarchy, okay? For example, think about you are furnishing a classroom, right? Do you do the um, lightning first, furniture first, or IT first? Like, you have to think about it, right? Which comes first? Uh, it's a good brainstorming tool. We mentioned those. You can attach cost, assign people the work, think about the durations, right? Top down. Uh, it's a top down up approach or bottom up. I want to emphasize this one. It can be, it can be hardware related, function related, or time sequence. Okay. You can do a work breakdown like this, for example. How can you make, what are the sub projects in a furnishing a classroom? That's going to be an assignment. So please listen carefully. So let's say uh, one of those sub projects can be IT. You agree? Yeah. One of them can be like the real furniture, which is the, you know, desk tables and professor's desk and maybe some other handicap, you know, disabled people's desk, and we, we think all of these things when furnishing, and you should as well. What else? Maybe lightning, right? And maybe you can say software, like every software, right? And then you come up, oh, maybe software goes under IT, right? So, yeah. Maybe you go down one more below, maybe software, and now you think of hardware, right? You want to know, like, will there be a Zoom component, right? I don't know. Is it going to be uh, Mac or Windows, right? Uh, maybe like this. Hardware. What can we say about hardware? Like the screens, maybe. How many of them, right? How many computers, right? How many machines, right? How fast are they? Are you gonna do? Are you gonna use this lecture hall as a lab, maybe for some simulation, right? Uh, so you come down to the lowest level of, and then you do this for the furniture as well, lightning, and we deleted the software. Okay, so you can do hardware related, or you can do like time sequence, right? And this shows you this first. I'm going to do the furnish furnitures, right? After furnishing, furnish furnitures, I'm going to think about the lightning. After lightning, I'm going to talk about, I'm going to think about IT, right? Now it's time sequential. Okay. So you, you decide which, which works for you. Okay. It, it all works. And I'm going to fast forward a little bit and show you this one. So what are the benefits of doing this? So you can attach the, the lowest level durations, right? For example, installing Zoom will take one day. Or you, you come up with these durations and then you add them up. And then you, you come up with a project timeline. You come up with all the tasks. You leave out nothing. So when you communicate your WBS, everyone in the team understands what is required, when it's going to be done, who is going to do it, okay? Authorities, linking to objectives, responsibility, detailed planning. You're going to update this, remember? You'll always update it, okay? If it's a big project, it's going to be updated. Cost, that's a wonderful one. You know how much is Zoom. So you attach it. You know how much the furniture will cost. You attach it, right? And then you add them up. You aggregate everything and you have the total cost. And time as well, right? Time as well. So your boss will be interested in cost and time mostly. Others, they will not really interest, be interested in, okay? So this is really helpful for those things. So various types. We already uh, talked about these things. So work package, there's this thing called work package, okay? The work package, knowing, understanding work package is very important. 
So work package is level four, right before the activities. After work package, there's activities. Okay, for example, as I said in the beginning, installing the tires in a comp company, in a factory, can be a work package. Screwing it, really installing it, like doing the actual work can be an activity. There may be more than one activity there, but installing the tires may be one work package. Uh, which, which cannot be further subdivided. Well, you can't really further divide installing a tire, right? I mean, it's, you just need to install it, right? So you can't really subdivide it. That's where you stop. In the assignment, I want you to stop there as well. You stop where you can't really go further. Okay. Also, it's clearly distinguishable. And that's the rule of thumb. And it requires, it requires eight to 80 hours. So from one day to two weeks. Okay. If it's more than two weeks to include, to do it, the work package, probably you can subdivide it. So I want you to subdivide it to two things, right? If it's less than eight hours, which is one day, it's not probably a work package. It, you should consider it as an activity. Okay. So eight to 80 hour rule is a, is a rule of thumb to come up with your, uh, okay. So. Uh, numbers, we already talked about the numbers, uh, benefits, you all know it now. Let's do. Oh, somebody also mentioned, I think it was Ricky. He was Ricky. Uh, we need a little bit more information, right? That's where comes the work breakdown structure dictionary really handy. We usually attach a dictionary to the WBS. That's called WBS dictionary. So, it's a little bit more details about every box. And usually it's written in Excel. Like you have 111, let's say buying the furnitures. And then you have an explanation. Who's going to buy it? When it's going to buy it? What's the color? Whatever, whatever they need to know, right? So it really supplements the real WBS. And, and we call it WBS dictionary, which you look at your dictionary to understand the words more, right? That's that's why they call it WBS dictionary. You have the WBS, but it's it's not including everything. So then you look at your dictionary to understand what that means. Okay, WBS dictionary. Okay, so you have the best WBS. You really detailed planned it out, and whichever best fits for your product project company, you have it. So what now you need, like John said, you need, is your project planning complete? No, that's just the first step. Okay. Now you need a sequential planning as well. Remember what I said in the WBS? It's not really hierarchy. The list doesn't really say this will come before that in especially other than waterfall. Nothing else. None of them tells which comes first, which comes next. Time, sequential, functional, hardware. It doesn't say anything. It's just a grouping of what's going to be done. Okay. So the next step, because in the video, boss said, how much is it? And when are we going to deliver? He's not interested in anything else, right? So you got to do something sequential order, right? Sequentially. So you got to sequentially list out your activities and finally, the last action will be delivering the cloud and then may create a network and then have a final delivery acceptance day. Okay. That's what we're going to do. So project managers work is never ending really until it's accepted. I'm not saying delivered because sometimes you deliver, but it's not accepted. Right. That's why in the scope, uh, there will be, there is an acceptance criteria, right? If you go back to slides, probably you'll see there's an acceptance criteria. What we call PERT. So let's say you're writing a report, right? One of the activities is writing a report. So you're, you're completing whatever testing you are doing for a product, right? And then uh, you're writing a report is an activity. And then you are completing the final report, which is 
activity number 10, let's say in this case, and completing the testing activity nine. So is that clear? Like, can you clearly understand what is to be done? You know, there's all other activities before this, you know, activity eight, seven, six, whatever. And then I'm just showing you here. Do you understand what is to be done here? Yeah, so you need a time, right, John, exactly. You need a time element, right? How long does it take for the report to be written? But before that as well, to complete the final pro report, you have to complete the testing, right? Now the arrows tells me before I even start writing the report about the test, the test should be completed. So if I'm a, if I'm a report writer, let's say my, ex my, my assignment is writing the report, I should go talk to tester guys and say, is it done? When it's done, I'm going to get all the documentation and write the report. Right? And it's going to take time. How long? Right? That's what we need to do. We cannot just say our boss that we completed the final report. And when he asks, well, did, did, is the test complete? Uh, no, they're going to complete one week later. Well, how come you write the final report before the testing is complete? Right? So that's what I mean, the sequential. That's somehow similar to waterfall, right? All the arrows shows you this should be complete before the next one starts, right? Okay, so that's the what you need to do next after WBS. Let's say this takes three weeks, right? It takes three weeks for me to write the report. And let's say I want to annotate here. Let's say this is the 15th week of our project, whatever we are doing, okay? And testing is done in 15th week. When can I probably complete my final report? Weeks, right? 18th week of the project, the, com the final report will be completed, okay? So we don't attach any dates, like calendar dates to these things, because you never know, right? You're always late one day, be early, maybe, maybe late. So we, we tell these three weeks. We don't say from 1st of April to... 21st of April. We don't, we don't say that. We always use the generic timing. Okay. Generic periods. I'm kind of, if you can observe it, I'm kind of making a transition from WBS to the network scheduling to tell the bus really when are you going to be done? Okay. Because that's one of the questions that they will ask. And sometimes after one activity, which we call the burst points, uh, there will be uh, multiple activities, right, that can be starting, and we call it burst point. And sometimes before a, an activity, like in this case 32, is complete, uh, before it starts or it's complete, 31, 18, and number 17 activities should be completed, right? And we call it sync. So sometimes we have the burst points, sometimes we have the sync points, okay? So that's how we do it. And then uh, you have this b long and complex things that you create. So we're, we're transitioning from WBS to this. How many paths do you see here from one to nine? To start with one and to end with nine. Four. What else? Four. So there is four paths that you can follow. And this gets really complex really easily. Okay. Because you want to decide which path are you going to follow as a project manager. Because some paths will be longer time. Some paths will be shorter time. And that's what we're going to work next week. Good. So today, a uh, quick review, uh, we're going to talk about different scheduling techniques, but we're going to focus on PERT, okay? And we're going to talk about how to identify the duration, right? And we're going to do a lot of hands-on activities, okay? Ready? All right, so we did, uh, we learned various, various types, right? Various types of WBS, and, and there was a lot of questions from WBS in the quiz, right? So, 
which one is harder to change? Which one is really hard to change if you need to update anything? Like very difficult to change if you need to add or delete any activity. Third one. Okay. Yeah. Third one. And everybody's writing. Yep. Third one is difficult, right? It's, it's really difficult. Okay. So you learned it already. Good. Uh, you did your best WBS. And then I said, so what? Because this is my favorite question, right? So what? So what? Right? So what? And, and we get into this a little bit. Is your project planning complete? What do you need to do? You have your WBS. Why don't you just start? Okay. How do you come up with the schedule? Like, how do you know? Let's talk about again this one. The one that I circled. How do you know about the schedule? And the reason is if, if you can include some time here, let's say venue requirements, I don't know, maybe it's 10 days, right? Maybe it's this one is 10 days. Maybe this one is 10 days. Maybe this one is 10 days. That's not working all the time like this. Okay. Just uh, because we really need to go into PERT. So WBS will not give you a a really good duration of the project. So technically, like conceptually, theoretically, when you submit, I mean, add those up, maybe you'll get the 40 days to arrange the venue. But again, it doesn't work like that. And you will understand it when I tell you the, when I teach you the part, okay? But starting with the WBS, starting with the expert views, asking technicians, operators, will help us a lot okay will help us a lot okay what is next step the next step is writing a report example right and i there was also questions so that's writing the report right that's activity number nine activity number 10 we also reviewed this right the last session so let's say you're completing a testing maybe validation testing or quality testing, anything like that. And then after the testing is done, after it's complete, only you can start writing the report. And only after the report is done, you can complete the final report. Okay? So that is what Ola says, which comes first and which comes next. Very, very important. Okay, which comes first, which comes last. So let's say writing the report three weeks and yeah, whatever is the ninth activity in this case, complete testing plus three weeks gives us when the final report will be complete, right? Think of this as a big, 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 big diagram. And then this is like very, very small part, maybe the last portion. Scheduling techniques, there are different different ways you can explain your scheduling and I'm not going to go into that but I will keep these in for your information Gantt chart like Ricky said you can use a Gantt chart okay if you even though you never saw this anywhere maybe yet look I mean it's very intuitive right task one whatever is that one starts that day and then ends that day hoping right scheduled to end Whatever is here, task two is starting here, right? Whatever task three starts here, but ends over here. And it looks like task two and task three starts at the same time. I mean, scheduled to start, right? <laughs> Nothing goes as planned, but yeah. Uh, task five, it looks like task, it, if you take a snapshot, like a, like an x-ray, right? Let's say, let me choose a color of yellow. If I take a snapshot of this in the factory or in your project, let's see, something like that. It looks like how many activities are going on at the, at the same time, right? It looks like task three is going on, task four is going on, task five is going on, task seven is going on. So as a project manager, you have to keep track of all these activities happening at the same time. You're not going to do all the work. People and team that you created and you assigned the work, you created a WBS for them and they will be doing this work at the same time. Okay? 
if you take a snapshot over here, it looks like it's only task 12, maybe like the submission of the report or something, right? And that's easy Excel sheet. And Excel gives Excel give you this. Maybe some of you already used it. You can create actually this in Excel. And this is Excel. If if you can see it, this is Excel, right? So that's Gantt chart. I'm not gonna go into the history or anything. Uh, so milestone. A military use this a lot. DoD uses this a lot. If any of you work with them, you will see. Everywhere is a milestone. They don't really like Gantt charts. I don't know why. Milestone, they like it. They have a lot of like decision points, milestone review, decision points, you know, initial operating capacity, full operating capacity, uh, or capability. So they have all these things. Okay. So that's also milestone. Okay. And through the end, and Gantt chart, you can read these things. Okay, per chart, program evaluation and review technique. This is what we're going to focus today. So, of course, just like most of the stuff, it's uh, developed by the military and U.S. military. And their challenge was the nuclear submarine. And we're talking about this just when the ocean gate happened, right? So, uh, yeah, there was a challenge there to put the people, I mean, the you know, the military, the weapon systems, uh, it's underwater, like everything you can imagine, you know, ammunition, right, everything, uh, communication systems, plus nuclear, right? So that was a big challenge. Humankind never did it before. So that's when they started thinking about PERT. Okay, how do we do this? Like, this is a huge project, right? How do we do this? And then, you know, every need creates an innovation. Remember, every need. So if you don't if you feel a need to improve your project management skills, you will never improve them. If you don't feel a need to improve your soft skills, you'll never improve them. Everything starts with a need, okay? Uh, so that challenge, you know, led the way to the per chart, okay? And there's also something called CPM. So the only thing I want to say here is PERT, which we will talk today, uh, is more stochastic than deterministic it uses probabilities it's event oriented there's uncertainty in it right uh, but when you look at the cpm with right cpm is uh, you 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 are better at knowing the durations of activities right how long they're gonna take you know the sequence more right so Think about the nuclear submarine project, right? That would be more pert because there's uncertainty, there is distributions, uh, you know, you don't know the durations. Humankind never did something like that. So how you know, right? I mean, uh, but CPM is more like if you are, think about the construction business, right? I mean, is there anything that we don't know about construction? What about the construction? I mean, what do you want to learn? Right, you know everything. Right? It takes this much to get the permit. It gets this much to do the base. Right, it gets this much to do the first floor, the second floor construction. Guys, can you can close their eyes and they can build that build a house for you? Okay. So I mean, CPM is that. So we're focusing on PERT more because a lot of the technology and innovative technology, we don't know what's going to happen at the end and how much it's going to take, right? And technology changes. It's not really written in concrete. Okay, so that's why we're going to talk about PERT, this one. Okay, this is the focus. Okay, what is this PERT and what kind of questions does that answer? Okay, Uh it answers how long will the project take? Uh, because it's kind of, let me draw it here. I don't know if you enjoy my drawings, but they are terrible. Let's say you have a, a WBS here, right? 
So, and you, you calculated the durations and the only thing that, that, that you need is sequences. So if you, like Ola said, if you can come up with which comes first and which comes last, right? And next. Isn't that beautiful? If you can change this, just WBS into this, right? This format into this format. Now it's really easy. How? Let's say this is the first activity. That's the second. That's the third. That's the fourth. That's the fifth. And that's the sixth. Okay. So let's say this, this activity takes five, day, five days, right? This activity from one to two. Right, this event, this activity, and then this takes three days. Whatever is it, I don't know. It's just generic. This takes two days. This takes seven days. This one takes uh, one day. This one takes two days. Okay, now tell me, please, when can we finish this? Let's say this is the completion, right? When can we finish the project? I know if you never saw this, it's strange, but I'm I'm trying to challenge you as always, okay? It, we're just learning. So how long it's going to take? Let's say these are week. Everything is weeks. How long it's going to take? The whole project. Because if you go this way, it looks like it's the shorter path, right? It's the shorter path. So if we go this way, five, six, eight weeks. If we say eight weeks, we are wrong. Because there are other activities. Do you, do, now, can you connect? Can you relate to the previous slides and where I said WBS doesn't work for your duration, really, right? It helps the estimation, but not for the project duration. Because for the project duration, you really you really need to put your intelligence and turn your WBS into this. And this is today's topic. How do you change this to this? Well, if, that's why I said in the projects, I guess I said it last week. I would like if when you, when you go to your companies, like for, I don't know how much deep will be your relationship, but ask them like, what are we doing? Do we have a PERT? Do we have a scope statement? Do we have uh, a WBA? They may say no, but that's fine. Maybe they are doing this every time. It's, uh, it's fine, but at least you know it. Okay. Okay. So that's why it helps us how long the project will take. It also helps us what are the risks. Uh, I wish I, I didn't delete it, but what are the risks? Right? Well, you went from the north, right? From the north path. What are the risks there? So the north path lasted 17 weeks as you calculated, what is the risk there? And the blue one was, uh, so one said, uh, the north said 17 weeks, the south said 8 weeks. What is the risk here? Delays in the long path, yes. Delays in the long path is the risk. If they are, if any of the activities are late, let's say one of, in the middle or the start or at the end, one day late, the project will be late one day. Do you get it? How about the eight weeks? If any of the activities in the uh, southern path, if any of them delay one day, what will happen to the... Sh what is the new project duration now? If any of the southern path is delayed one day, what is the total project, delay, delay, uh, project duration now? I have a 17. What else? It's delayed one day. It doesn't impact the duration because it was eight weeks. Now they will complete nine weeks. But the north path is still ongoing, right? We cannot just say for sure, but 99.9% .9 the project duration will not be delayed. Okay, got the logic? That's the risk. So once you are done with the PERT, as a project manager, you go to the wall and like you print it out on the wall, right? You're going to see what are some of my risks? Mm. 
the, the risk is the longer path because if they are late, the project duration will be late and you promised your CEO that you're going to deliver 1st of July. Now it's 2nd of July. Does it matter? I don't know. Sometimes it may matter because sometimes it's not weeks, but it's, uh, well, 1st of July, 8th of July, really, because it's, we are talking about weeks, right? Sometimes it's years. Maybe you are constructing a, a, a highway, right? Maybe you're doing a, a bridge, right? So these are all important. Because your company will be promoting that, advertising that, hey, we're going to finish it 1st of July. Everybody will be, will be having a safe travel in the 4th of July weekend. So, you know, you know, understand. But when you're late, everybody will say, oh, they said they will complete before 4th of July, but now they can't complete. What is going on, All right? Okay, these are the risks. These are the risks. We're going to learn them. And we're going to also learn what can we do, right? Why we have tools that that to solve our problem. Okay. What are the activities? Sure. And maybe sometimes how can we complete quickly, right? More quickly. And what's the slack time? We're gonna talk about slack time. Okay, what needs to be done before doing anything really? And we we talk about it, right? It's the estimates. How, what is the act duration for each activity? How long that do they take, right? That's the first thing. <laughs> take a average, right? Take average. How, but average of what? Check previous similar activities. Yep. Ask people, right? Ask people. Check existing data. Hopefully companies are documenting, right? Hopefully they are documenting. History, SMEs. Yeah. Talk to SMEs. Okay, let's talk to three SMEs, right? One says, well, Ricky, we usually complete it in two weeks. You go to the other person because you don't, not trust, but you want to get the more data you want, right? You go to other technician, which works in the same department, but maybe in a different shift or whatever. Uh, they say, uh, we usually complete in four weeks. What? I mean, somebody just said two weeks. Now you're saying four weeks. And then you go to someone else and then they say, uh, I don't know, maybe three weeks. Okay, so what do I do now? Like everybody telling me different things. Right? Okay, that's our challenge as well. It's not really easy. So of course, gather historical data, right? But how about doing a rough estimation? Simpson's rule. So you just get the optimistic plus pessimistic plus four times most likely. Okay? And this is how it works. And then divide them by six. Okay. So when you go to an operator or technician or whoever, right? And you ask them, how long does it take? And they will say, I don't know, two weeks, right? Okay. So here's the question that we want to ask. What do you think like the fastest you can complete this, right? This is optimistic. And ask them, what do you think everything goes wrong and like what is the longest time that you can complete this and they're going to give you some time too and now they will you also ask them like okay don't think of the extremes not everything going perfect not everything going wrong uh they will give you some well okay so ask these and get so one technician three numbers and then you sit down and then you calculate your number for the duration. Okay. So that's Simpson's rule. All right. And then uh, it's good. I like this technique because it also helps us with the standard deviation. And why why do we need the standard deviation? Well, we, if you want to do anything with the probability, you need it. All right. So in the in the coming sessions, again, I'm saying math is getting a little bit heavier. So the standard deviation, we can use it for our probabilistic. And why are why do we need probability in a project management? We need it. Okay. And how to find it is just pessimistic minus optimistic divided by six. Okay. And also, uh, if you square this, you find the variance, of course. Let's see if some result we already hear, right? Okay, so we also covered the burst points and sync points, right? Sync points. 
if one of the activities or points are uh, dividing into more than like we can't start activity number 31 and 18 and 17 before 16 is complete then we call it burst and sometimes before 31 18 17 is complete 32 cannot start right or sometimes at the end of the project this is really like the project completion right it, maybe the closing the project or something it, so dummy activities uh doing the pert sometimes you need dummy activities right and what is dummy activity is for example i want to close this one so dummy activity is the activity that needs to be done right needs to be carried out but really doesn't take time so something like that okay you have to complete this but it doesn't really uh, have time doesn't take time and stuff so for example d let's open the other one so let's let's see how the proceeding goes here so activity a can start anytime right i mean it starts immediately not anytime because it looks like the first activity b starts immediately there's no previous activities then a and b d when does d start d starts once the a and what else and b is done when a and b is completed then only d starts but notice that like i have a dash line here right that shows the dummy activity that shows that it's a dummy activity not taking time but they are somehow uh, related to d like d is related to d okay so not taking time but connecting uh these b and d just with a logical dashed line okay so maybe maybe you are doing some backyard project okay some projects in your backyard, and you need this activity is maybe like digging right you want to dig so and let's say b is uh, going to home depot and getting some tools right okay so these are not really directly related maybe this is the cleaning of the backyard right so before cleaning after before the cleaning is complete you can start digging right maybe you can also say like marking where to dig right but you also need tools you need to also purchase the tools right you cannot dig it without tools so but they are not really directly connected right but you need that dummy line there to show that hey you know what did you buy the tools yes did you do the cleaning and marking yes okay now we can start digging got the point so we will we will talk about this later again but this is what is dummy activity that we need that if you get that like, whenever you see a perk you will you will notice a lot of dummy activities going on in the perk so here's my question if the if this activity whatever is it complete testing finishes at 10th week and writing the report last three weeks when can the uh the completion of final report starts 13 yes so it starts 13 right so is that enough for your scheduling in your calendar because so far we didn't talk about dates we only talk it generic right after the testing is done you have to write the report and then it takes three weeks so it's 10 plus three uh <clears throat> so how do we do this like when do we start when do we when do we not start or when do we finish right so every part this is the nomenclature that's what we should write so duration goes in the middle that's wherever you look you should see this so duration goes in the middle earliest start time goes to the top left okay 
earliest finish time goes to the uh, top right. Latest finish time goes to bottom right. And latest start time goes to the bottom left. And select time goes to the uh, to the bottom. Okay. Okay, so this is very important. So whatever is the activity over here, let's say completing a report. Whatever is the earliest start time, duration, earliest finish time. Latest start time, select time, latest finish time. Okay. All right. Uh, earliest start time is eight. Okay. Earliest start time is eight. So if the earliest start time is eight, I don't care if it's weeks or days, but in this case, I said days, right? And the earliest finish time is 10 days. What is the, how long does it take to write the report in this case? So earliest start is eight, earliest finish is 10. How long does it take me to do the activity? There's, there's an activity going on and you can start that activity earliest start eight, latest start, latest finish is 10. How long does it take? Two days. Yes, you got it. Okay. So let's continue. So let's say we can latest start time is 15. What is the latest finish time? What did you do? You 15 plus two, 17, right? Great. Okay. So what is the wiggle room in this activity? What we call wiggle room is not project management, you know, jargon, but it's the slack time. What is the slack time here? is basically 15 minus eight or 17 minus 10, which is seven. And what does that mean? That means you can start as early as the eighth day, but however, you can also start as late as 15 days. I mean, uh, 15th day. Okay, so there is seven days of slack time right that you can start or not start it, nothing is delayed if you start in the fifth i mean 15th day and nothing is delayed if you start in the eighth eighth day okay as long as you complete it in of course two days right that's that's another story so a critical path is really in the beginning you all decided that the longer path is important one right that's the select time. Okay, that's the select time. How do you find the a critical path? What you want to do is find activities with zero slack. Why I can't write it. Find activities with zero slack. Let's say, uh, let's say, uh, I want to keep it clear. So, Let's say we have some activities over here, over here, over here, over here, and then one here maybe, right? I want to say also, let's make it a little bit more complex and then make it here as well. Okay, so you did the select times and then let's say this one is zero, 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 zero select time. This one is one, this one is two, this one is one, this one is one, this one is zero. How you want to do is you want to combine, track all the zeros, and now this is your critical path. This is very, very important to find. Because whatever is going on, if anything late, anything is delayed in here, it's going to cause your project duration to be slipped. That's your schedule to be slipped because they don't have any vehicle room. They just need to start and they just need to finish as promised. Okay. So that's why we call it critical path. Now as a project manager, your eyes really need to be in this path. If anything, anybody doing party here, 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 and no party time here, but here, just what you want to do, just get the resources and help out these guys instead of get, getting them make a party. 
because they these guys need help. They gotta they gotta complete them on time. Okay. So that's schedule slip because nobody likes it. Do you remember? <clears throat> Here is the one. Very important. So you got all the durations and you come up with the PERT from WBS, you trans transform to uh, PERT. And then let's say you got the Simpsons rule, you got the durations. That's all you need to do. Okay. Get the PERT, this one, and get the durations. Okay. Uh, and then let's say, let's say this is, uh, well, we can say zero. So what, what we do is, so let's say this, this takes two days. This is also two. This is four. This is one, right? And this is two. Okay. So what you want to do is find the earliest start and earliest, uh, latest start time. So what is the earliest start time for activity one? Well, immediately, right? It starts zero. It starts zero time. Yeah. What is the early? Now I'm, I'm not writing early start because you know where they are, right? So earliest start is zero. Duration is two. What is the earliest finish? Two. So zero plus two, two, right? So do I go here or here? Let's go here. So we just carry two here. Okay. And then two here. So two plus two, four, right? There's only one arrow. So we carry it, carry it over here. Four plus four, eight, right? Eight carries over here. And then eight plus one, nine. Okay. Projects is done. Project is done in ninth month. This is four. Okay. And then this, this is called forward pass, which means you do all the top ones and then you, you do backward pass. So you put whatever is the latest here, right? And then what, this is the latest finish time, right? What's the latest start time for the activity five? Eight. Yes. And do we carry eight here and here? Which one do we carry? We carry eight here and here, right? Because there is two, two ways. Okay. Eight for both. Yes. And then let's continue from the top bottom. What is the latest start time? Eight minus two is six, right? Yes. Six. So how about here? We should continue. We should do in parallel, right? We can't just do one and then complete. We should go in parallel. So before going there, we should go here. Eight. What is the latest start time here? Four. Yes. So we carry four here. What is the latest start time here? Two. Yes. So we carry over here. What is the latest start time here? Wait, you should be careful here, okay? Uh, and then what is the start time here? Zero. Okay. So now is the critical moment. What is the select time? So what is the select time for critical activity? I mean, activity one. Zero. Right? How about activity two? Zero. Yep. How about activity four? Zero. Yep. How about activity five? Zero. Yep. How about activity three? What is the select time here? Four. Yes. So what is the rule? Go to the slacks, find the zeros, and then connect them. Okay. So we go here. Zero, 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 zero. And then this is the critical path. So these guys have no room to, you know, party. These guys have four days or weeks to party. So you do forward first and then backward. And only then you can come up with the slack time. 
And then only then you can come up with the critical path. Ask like, can you complete it earlier? Your boss will also ask, how quicker can you complete? What is the earliest time that you can deliver that project, right? They will ask you that as well. Is there a duration that you can deliver a hundred time percent percent on time for sure? That, that that's gonna they're gonna ask those questions. What do you need to make it faster? Maybe they're not happy you're delivering that time. They will ask you, what do I what do you want from me that you can deliver faster? Because we can and it's it's math. Okay. So next week we're gonna find out the answers for the CEOs. In going to the, of course, a little bit review, hands on exercises. We're going to walk into probabilistic domain, okay, probability area. So, and Z tables and, and normal distribution. So, if you are not good at probability and Z tables and normal distributions, you know, try to understand. And so, that's all we were going to do. But it's really helpful when you work in a project. It's it's really helpful, especially if you are in the senior position, like mid-senior, mid-level, senior level. It's really helpful. Uh, this session will be really helpful for those still, I mean, those professionals. And we'll talk about schedule compression. All right. So, a little quick review, okay? So, if I start earliest eight week, day, whatever, and I'm finishing a 10th week. What is the duration of the activity? Two. Yeah, the activity duration is two. Everybody got that. All right, if the latest finish time is 17, if the latest start time is 15, what is the select time? Seven. Yes. So, if what we talk just this minute is not familiar to you, please go back to the previous session. Review it, learn it, and also go through this session again and then learn it. Okay, I'm not going to explain it now. So what questions are answered by PERT? How long will the entire project take? Right? How can we answer that? The critical path. Yes, the critical path. If you find all the select zeros, first find all the selects. After going forward and backward, like we call it forward pass and backward pass, and then you find the select time, and then you find all the select zero. Some of them will not uh, be zero select. And when you connect all the zero select, you're going to find the critical path, and it's going to tell you how long is the project will last. What are the risks? What can we say about risk? Like, why, why PERT gives us some hint about risks? I mean, how come this complex diagram PERT give us some idea about risks? I have zero slack. I have no time for vacation. That team needs to work hard and needs to deliver on time. That's the risk. As a project manager, you are responsible for the whole PERT, right? And uh, some not sometimes, most of the time, a lot of the time, there will be parallel activities going on at the same time in your project, right? At the same time. So you want to understand which one to focus more than others because some of them will have zero slack, right? Zero slack. That's risk. That's risk. Which activities delays the project time? If they are late, what kind of activities, if they are late, will delay the project delivery, like the final, final project delivery? Items on the critical path. If they are one day delayed, any of them, one week delayed, the project will be delayed one week. Okay. So that's very critical. That's why we, we look for the risk in those paths. If needed, how can we get the project completed more quickly? How can you complete a project quickly? I mean, I have the PERT now. I, you know, here's the big picture. So I got the scope down, right? Scope statement on work. I got that one done. And then we move to the work WBS, work breakdown structure. And then what we did is understand the durations using Simpson's role or anything you want. You understood the duration of each activity. Right, but WBS doesn't give you uh, 
the idea of duration. It doesn't give you really. Uh, and then that's why you need to convert WBS into PERT. When you have PERT now, and that's where we are today, when you write the durations, then you can understand now your project. But going through all these things, and I, I'm, I'm telling my boss that we will complete in 33 weeks. Can I complete it earlier? Reassign resources. Yeah, so give some more resources, right? If you have it. Uh, level the resources. Level the capacities, right? People, yeah, give more people to critical path. Or uh, how can you give more people? I mean... Right? So these are all difficult questions, actually. We are, I don't have a pool of people, right? I mean, I have two software engineers. I don't, I don't, I can't afford to have five and just have three of them, you know, just wait idle just in case somebody needs a software engineer. That's, no, that's, you are more valuable than that. Okay? People will hire you and, and make you work. You're not going to stay like doing nothing. Prioritization of activities, yeah. If if four activities are going on at the same time, just just evaluate them, assess them, and then see which ones can be done quickly, earlier, or in parallel, right? So, so I'm gonna add my, one more challenge today, okay? So you have this one already, okay? Uh, I'm gonna come back to this one if you don't have it in another screen or in your iPad or on your paper. You can either write this down now because I'm gonna make you one more challenge, right? So we're gonna we're gonna take one more step into the unknown. So if you can just jot this down on your iPad, you know, paper, anything like that. So this is pert, right? But I told you in the beginning, right? Uh, and I gave examples for military. Military good is good at planning. Right, but they are also very good at, or maybe even better than, that updating the plan. Right, I told you this. As a project manager, you have to be such, because this pert. I mean, even this little pert here, right? Five activities. It's nothing. Uh, it's gonna require updates. It's gonna require updates. What can? Why it can require updates? Well, there may be some activities added. Maybe there's a customer request, right? And and you know my my position about customer requests, right? We we talk about it. I remember the requirements creep. So it's I don't always accept, uh, but uh, uh, there may be sometimes. Maybe it's logical. And and remember, this is the planning phase. Are we are we really doing this? No, we're still in the planning phase, right? At least getting this done and updating it and then publishing it will have, even after publishing this and, you know, sharing this with the team and the customer and the sponsor and the boss, even after that, there will be updates. Okay. So there may be activities added. There will be activities deleted. Then, well, if it's six days, maybe now it's going to be seven days because now somebody gets to, needs to get the paint, right? Mix it, you know. And design the wall. Okay, which place I'm gonna, uh, and then and then the activity content changes, right? The process changes, although it's still activity three, right? So there can be this kind of stuff. So it's gonna change. It's gonna change. So here's my challenge. You already wrote the other uh, part, other slide down. So a new activity is added as activity six. With a duration of 11 weeks. I'm going slowly. So you can digest. It must be completed before activity 5. And after activity 3. So why am I giving this scenario? Because I want you to be able to like exactly locate it in the part. Where you're going to insert this activity. Right? That's why I have to tell you which activity first. Before that, which activity comes after that? In real life, nobody will tell you. As a project manager, you will understand that this sentence, you will pick this sentence. Nobody will tell you, right? Management is concerned. Well, the, the new duration is 11 weeks for the activity six. Is 11 weeks. 
okay but this this gets the management stressed out because now they are thinking uh the project will slip 11 weeks right what was the solution in your what it was it 33 weeks or oh, no uh, this was 18 right let me see was it 18 so it was 18 weeks now because of this activity right uh the, the management the leadership is very worried about because they communicate this right they tell the customers hey we're gonna be done in 18 weeks right now they are concerned a little bit and they think that the project will be 11 weeks more which is 18 plus 11 now they are thinking 29 weeks which they think so long okay they are really getting worried because the leadership is worried. Now Ahmed is saying, no, no, no. Even though this activity is 11 weeks, it's not going to take, it's not going to delay the project 11 weeks. And everybody is really surprised. Okay. Is she or he right? Which means really the project will not take another 11 weeks. It's not going to take 11 weeks. But the leadership is worried because they don't have your expertise, guys. They just think that when you add an activity, it, it just post delays the project completion. Okay. So let's help them. <clears throat> let's give them a number. Okay. Even here, activity six with a duration, it must be complete before activity five and after activity three. So you have the place in the PERT. And you have the duration. Oh, what is the duration? Yeah. Now just go through really quickly, okay? So okay. these numbers are wait, what is my thingy here? Okay. These are the durations it one, okay? We yeah, always put the durations in the top middle. And then this is the earliest mm -hmm. earliest start time. This is the earliest finished, I mean, latest start time. Okay. And let's go here. This one, latest start time. This one, latest finish time. As I said in the beginning, not all the numbers are here. And that's part of the challenge, right? To keep you warmed up and to keep you heated, right? And this number over here is the slack time. I didn't include the slack time here. I didn't include the slack time here. I didn't include the slack time here because I want you to, to be able to, you know, identify them and calculate them. Okay. Let's raise this one. And I clarified for everybody one more time. So it's not only you. Okay. So I don't know. I don't, I, do I know the answer? Do I have the answer here? I don't know, but let's see. So it's something like this, right? Okay, so what is the duration? How, how many weeks was the duration? Previously, it was 18. What is the new duration? 24. Okay, if it's 24, then 24 minus 18 is six weeks should be correct. Right? So what I want you to understand is, even though you add an activity into PERT somewhere, okay, it's not going to slip the whole project. Why it's six weeks? Why is it not 11 weeks? And when it when can it be really 11 weeks like the management is concerned? If you edit, if I edit the activity on this path, right? Because this is the critical path. Then it would make it because look, zero slack, zero slack zero slack i don't have time to and this is zero slack too i don't have time to party okay but i intentionally edit it here so you can see the difference because otherwise we wouldn't be able to discuss this point it's just you will you would always think that if i add something the project will slip no and also it's not always as easy as this of course right you will have, uh, you know, things coming up this way, right? And you might have, like, somewhere from here, 
to here, can this be possible? Of course. In the beginning, remember I showed you a slide and said, how many paths do you see? Well, these are all paths, right? So it can be as complex as this, right? Even another like route, you know, this is one, two, three, four, five. Maybe there is something coming from this way to this way, right? And maybe some boxes over here. Excellent. Really good. So, so okay. So that's, that's our nomenclature, right? We always put the earliest start time to the top left. In the middle, it's the duration. On the top right, it's the earliest finish time. Top uh, bottom middle is the select time. To the left, latest start time. To the right, latest finish time. And just one more sentence to explain. What is the earliest start time? That's the earliest time. You know, it's not a date like first of January or something. It's a it's a period that you can start this activity. Well, when can you start the earliest time? And this is that. When can you start the earliest time? For example, then I built a building. Do you want to start before you get the permit from the city? You shouldn't. Maybe they will say, no, that land is not available. Or this part is, you measured it wrong, right? Oh, we can't allow three floor, three story buildings because that's a farm site. We can only allow one, one story, right? Uh, so there will be, they will say a lot of things. So you don't want to start really constructing the building, even like whatever is the first activity, right? Maybe making a fence or something. You don't want to do it before you get the real permit done, approved, right? So that's why if you are, your first activity in constructing the house can't really start before you get the city permit, permit from the city, right? That's, that's what it is saying, earliest start time. And what is it saying, latest start time? Okay, you got the permit, but you don't have to start the fencing yet, right? Okay, when can I start the fa uh, fencing, like fencing my land? Well, you can only start as late as this much, right? And that's latest start time. It was a little bit advanced, but it's good. Okay. All right. So, still in the reviews. Okay. Uh, I hope it's correct. Okay. So let's let's just. I'm just. I'm not gonna do it. I really want. I have to go to probability. So let's just do it quickly. Okay. So these are the durations. Right? When can you start activity D? Right now. Immediate start. Right, immediate start. That's what you should have done in your homework. And then you go the forward pass. You know, I'm just going quickly. Forward pass. And I have a 33 here. Do I know the critical path yet? A quick backward pass. Okay. We're doing it. Okay, if everything is correctly animated here. So here you, you can have all the things, but I, I just left the select time out, I guess. So let's, let's do it really quickly. Just, uh, what is the select time in activity D? Here, activity three. I mean, activity D in D. Uh, it's, e. it's still one. We just had one. Install. How about here? Zero, eighteen minus zero. 18. How about here? Still zero. How about here? Still zero. Zero. Let's go back here. In select time, you can start anywhere. It doesn't matter. You can start anywhere. So let's do this one first. I don't care. What is the select time here? Fifteen. Uh, fifteen. Uh, let's write. How about here? Zero. Zero. How about here? Zero. Zero. Let's find the critical path together. So. <laughs> This is zero, so that's not that. So let's go over the zero here. And then what's the next zero over here? Can I go move here? And then go down and then go up here and then finish, right? Yeah. You see, that's the, that's the risky route for me, for, for all of us. So it's A, F, 
G H C. Mm -hmm. Unless if you did it like this, this is correct. Okay. So uh, some some just advanced things. If if you cannot connect, if you, if if any of the routes doesn't give you all zero slack, you're doing something wrong. Go back and check the dates. Okay. Check the durations. If you cannot connect from start to finish, okay, that's a that's a big tip for you. That's an advanced tip. I will not go back here, okay? So after here, what is the probability of completing the project in 18 hours or less? Which one is the previous one, okay? So we are completing in 18 hours, right? What is the probability of completing the project in 18 hours or less? Can your CEO ask this question? Ah, I mean, just ask yourself like, you got any 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 uh, courses, right? What's the probability of you passing the course, right? So, what is the probability of completing? The pro they want to know. They want to know. Okay. Uh, what is the probability of completing the project in fifteen hours or less? Hmm. Now it's getting harder, right? What is the? Let's answer the first question. What is the uh, probability of completing the project in? 18 hours or less, which was the duration was 18 hours. Yeah, it's 50%. You either complete or not, right? But how do we do this mathematically? It's not 100%, by the way. It's just our calculations, right? So it's, it's 50. You either co uh, complete it or not. That's it. But the CEO is asking, can you, what is your probability of completing in 15 hours? So they are challenging us, not because they don't like us, no, it's not because they don't like us. Maybe they want to be earlier than another competitor company. Maybe they want to launch the project, product, whatever is this, uh, just three hours before. Well, in this case, three hours doesn't make sense, but yeah, let's say three weeks, right? So, uh, or they want to they wanna move to another project. So once I am complete here, they will move my personnel to another product or project, right? That may be a case too. So people will always, your boss will always ask you, can you complete earlier? For example, or they can say, give me a time that you are 95% sure that you will finish on time. Okay. So your PERT is saying 18 weeks, let's say, but please give me a time that you are 95% sure that you're going to complete within this time. They don't want any schedule slip because they want to promise everybody. Maybe they will go to the, you know, uh, news out, news channels, news outlet. They will make ma marketing. They're going to say, first of January, we're launching. So it's like hard, hard date. Okay. So they want, they want, they may ask such, such questions to you. So our job is never done. Okay. Our job is never done. So, what is this? A few sessions ago, we talked about a little bit Six Sigma. I think one asked the question then. It was a little advanced for that moment, but this is our normal distribution, right? This is our normal distribution. <coughs> so, this will help us to, uh, to answer our CEO's questions. Okay? This, this little thing here. Because he asked us or she, hey, can you complete earlier? Or he said, can you give me a time, a duration to complete the project with a 95% confidence? You are confident that 95% you will complete the project, right? Well, a little bit statistics. I'm so sorry, but yeah, we have to do this. <clears throat> so say if you have five variables and you have averages for those variables, which... Think of it as this, uh, like these are the, let's say, activity one, right? And that's the duration. Let's say you did the Simpson rule and whatever, and then you got 12, right? And then activity two, two you got 29, right? But it, they are hidden. Like This is the end result. Well, the average is easy. In the total average for the PERT, well, when you connect those, let's assume that it's becoming a PERT for us, right? Do this. Uh, you just add up the averages, you got 107, okay, 107. Well, these are the standard deviations as well, but I apologize. 
we cannot just, and I'm going to ask these in course too, we cannot just add these things. No, it, it's not working that way. Standard deviations, we cannot add. That's why you, ca you cannot just say 1 plus 5, 6, plus 4, 10, plus 7, 17, plus 3, uh, 20. The answer is not 20. Okay? What we need to do is something else. Okay, so please bear with me here. So standard deviations, you cannot add. Okay, averages, you can. But variances, we can add. If we come from standard deviation to variance, then we can add. Just, just simple math, okay? Which, as you all know, variance is the square of standard deviation, right? Or the standard deviation is the square root of variance, right? Uh, and you can do this too, right? This is this is good. So, and sometimes we show it like this or this. So, but remember, this is only for independent random variables, which means a lot of stuff, but I'm not going to cover. So this is independent random variables for, for that's true. That's only true for independent random variables, okay? And that's a technical phrase if, I'm sure everybody heard about it. Okay, so independent. We are assuming that. So why do we need it? <clears throat> well, CEO and program manager is asking you a lot of questions, right? So after you present your per to <clears throat> your CEO, let's say it's 107 days, okay? Your CEO started bombarding you with the questions, okay? Hey, what is the problem of completing the project 107 days or or less and you know it it's 50 right you can just complete it or not that's easy what is the probability of completing the project in, in 120 days so so he wants to ask you okay you're telling me 107 days but i'm giving you 13 more days what is the probability of completion he wants to make sure that he can invest in marketing advertising promoting this thing okay or also asking, what is the 90.32% probability that you're going to complete the project on time? <clears throat> so give me some time that you can. You are 90.32% confident that it's going to be done. Normal distribution and the standard deviation table that I just showed you will help us with this. Okay, so let's answer his questions. So let's go back to our table, okay? <clears throat> so I just added another column, as you realize here. So I added the variance. And the reason is because I cannot just do this here, right? As I explained a little bit, I, I, I'm not explaining the details, but we can't do this. But I, what I said is if you do those standard deviation square them you can then add them right in the previous slide and you're gonna review it later so you can if you square them you can add them up now got it so if that's the case what is the total variance here please calculate it's 10 right it's 10 uh so I just square those things and then I add them up, right? And here, I just square them and add them up. I find a hundred. Have to go move from variance to standard deviation. Just take a square root of it, and then it's ten. Okay, it's ten. So that's the easy part. This is our values. How how the tables. Well, I'm going to show you a Z table, how the values are created in the Z table. Okay. I'm not, uh, if you're not understanding everything, that's fine. We're going to review it. So, but just uh, understand the idea. So there's this uh, equation over here. Okay. Which we calculate the Z values and somebody already tabulated them and then put it, put it on a piece of sheet, which is called Z table. Okay. So using that Z table and using this one, we're going to answer CEO's questions. Okay. 
So, what is X is really like X is the duration of interest or duration in question. Like, see, you remember what the CEO said? Hey, uh, Wang, you're saying you're going to complete in 107 weeks, but I'm giving you 13 more weeks. Tell me what is the confidence level that you're going to complete it, right? So that's the duration in question. I want to say this is the duration in question, 120. What is our normal duration? Like our per show, it shows us an average of 107. Okay, so my regular average is 107, and the duration in question is 120. Well, CEO may ask me, uh, hey, what is the probability for completing 130 days or weeks, right? Well, he, he just happened to say 120. So, can you, okay, so this number can change, but this will stay the same because it's the average, right? So, 10 comes from standard deviation over here. So that's why I wanted to explain you a little bit that because I'm going to use it here as well as the real case here. Okay. So that's why you really need to do this thing over here to find this. It's not 20, it's 10. Okay. So once you got that one, now it's easy. You just plug in the numbers and you have a Z value, which is 1.3 in this case okay now we're going to look it up on the z table so get this z number which is 1.3 and what are we trying to do we're trying to answer the ceo's question and he said he asked you are telling me you're going to complete in 107 days or yeah days i'm going to giving you 13 more days okay granted what is your confidence level so getting this 1.3, then we're going to look up the Z table and come up with a number for him. So that's our Z table. I'm sure everybody saw this one in the exams and everything. So a lot of, so somebody tabulated this for us. Okay. And have to look it up. So our Z, Z number 1.3, right? So what you want to do is go to 1.3. And it's zero as well, right? One point, if it was 1.31, then I would go to this one, right? This, this, uh, column here. I would go, I would go here, but it's 1.300, which is this column. And this is my number. And you, you multiply this with a hundred and it's 90.3 or 33 is my confidence level. So you now have 90%, 90 90.32% uh, confident that you're going to complete it 120 weeks. from weeks to days always but yeah. this slide is like a magic okay so my target for 120 or less is 90 percent 90.32 percent okay so in the quiz uh, like three weeks later or something there will be little questions for that okay so what is the probability of failure then i mean i can't finish the project if i can finish the project 90 per 90 point 32 percent right what is the probability of failure again these are independent right these are independent variables so if i am succeeding 90 percent yes when i did 100 minus 90 point 32 then whatever is the result is my failure rate my failure probability of failure okay so it's nine point, yeah, nine point sixty-eight. All right. So <clears throat> now you you get an idea of. Now I'm gonna show you the same questions, and now you get an idea of how to address those questions. Can you complete it earlier? Right. How quicker can you deliver? 
is there a duration that you can deliver 100% on for sure? What? Right? Well, you need to make it faster. Let's find answers. And we, we discussed it a little bit in the beginning, right? How can you make it faster, right? Get some activities parallel, get more people, get a contractor if you have money, uh, rent another machine in the production line. Uh, yeah, all these things. Just just work over time, after hours, right? Weekends. Okay, so these are the answers. That means we have to compress our schedule, right? We have to schedule. How? We can eliminate some parts. We really look at our part again, which is very calm, and go, by, go one by one for the remaining activities and, and say, which one can I eliminate, really? Right? Which one can I eliminate? Or which one can I substitute with a, with a shorter one? Right? Maybe I, I plan to go with a car, like, you know, driving to a client site. Now I want to go flying. And now I save two days, right? So can I substitute some activities? Can you parallel, make parallel some activities? Can I shorten the activities, right? Can I add more resources? Can I increase the work? No, yeah, these are all good. And this is called crashing the project crashing the project so we're moving kind of it <clears throat> now we got the third we got the probabilities now we want to do it quicker right because our boss is, wants us to make it quicker and these are the things that we can do what is the risk to compression anyone experienced any risks brutal outcomes right because people will be tired so safety issues, exactly. Safety issues. People get tired. They will they will skip testing. Hey, we don't have time. Let's skip that test. My PPE. I'm not gonna wear my PPE. Right? Well, if something happens, then you're gonna die. But you don't care because you don't have time. Your boss is rushing you. <clears throat> okay. So you're gonna skip some testing. <clears throat> so there's all these kind of things happening. Okay. <clears throat> so there will be quality issues because you're skipping tests, right? There will be errors. I'm not going to wear my PPE, right? I'm, I'm not going to do some of my customers' state-only work, which is really bad because they may not accept it. While finding additional resources, uh, who's going to find resources, by the way? We're always saying, hey, find resources and stuff. Who is going to find it? You. Project manager. Well, if you go out there to New York, to wherever, to find money for a week, right? Then you're not supervising the work. So when you come back, people will be doing all kinds of different, maybe wrong stuff if your communication is not good. So you will have to rework a lot of the stuff. So because you're not supervising, you're not there for questions. You're not there to check them, to check their work because you're trying to find money. This will cause more, more problems. Okay? It's not, there's no word that you just ask for money and your program manager will give you the money. No, that's not the case. Okay? And that's where we cover the earned value management and stuff like that. And job safety, product safety will be a huge issue and you can add to this list. Okay? Uh, right on time. This covers everything that I wanted to say today. So today what we're going to do is quick review. I always like to have some review, not, not really long. And I will talk about resource leveling. We'll talk about schedule compression. Okay. And we'll talk about fast tracking and crashing. These are both techniques for schedule compression. Okay. So fast tracking and crashing. And then we will have hands-on activities and, and everything. Let's see what I also have. Okay. All right, resource leveling. Let's let's talk about resource leveling. What is it, and why do you why do you need it? Probably you heard resource leveling. Sometimes you may have people resource. Sometimes you need to have money. Sometimes maybe you are renting a machinery, maybe a product line, maybe a warehouse, maybe a clean lab, right? Maybe a right supercomputer. Uh, that can process uh, maybe simulations or data faster, right? These are all resources. 
And in your project, there will be times that maybe more people or more teams want to use it, right? Maybe in your PERT, there will be some moments that when, when you get an x-ray, when you get a snapshot, more people might be working on that machine or maybe you have a software engineer and then in, in some parts of the activities in your PERT, maybe more than one node need designer. So all these things requires you to look at your activities and try to understand where is the overload, right? Or maybe that there might be in this long project, right? There might be, why do we need it? We need it because we have one designer. We need it because we have one machine. We have only one lab, one meeting room and all the things. Okay. That's the resource leveling. So that makes you look at your resources and level them. And sometimes you need more to do this kind of stuff because, uh, you know, your CEO will say, what's the probability of completing the project? 42 hours or less. What is the percentage? What's, what's the probability of uh, completing a project? <laughs> 50%. Yes. So you can just, you can maybe finish it earlier or not, right? 50%. And, and you know the math behind it now. And please do this on your own. And you're going to find it's 50% when you apply it, when you find the variables and you, you apply it to Z table and you're going to find it's really 50%. And what is the probability of completing it earlier, right? Your CEO, your program manager, your portfolio manager will ask you these questions. Or they will say, tell me a time duration that you can you you are 95% confident that you're going to finish that time because uh, they will uh, make contracts with some uh, marketing companies uh, they will some create some websites, right? They're going to give due date to software engineers or whoever, right? Website designers. And they will say, okay, by this time, website needs to be ready, right? So these are all coordinated in the companies, right? We, we don't want to work in silos. We want to work collaboratively, right? We don't want to work in silos. And the thing is, sometimes different it's not only your your only project and your part, right? So it's not only your part as well. So in the company, there will be multiple projects in multiple teams. Okay, so that is even tricky. But this is the hard part. Hard part because project managers don't talk. <laughs> they will plan the designer for the same week, probably, maybe, right? So they will not talk to each other. They will not talk to each other with every details. And they will just plan their part like, like they are the only project in the whole company and the entire business, okay? And, and, and maybe a few of the nodes will, will overlap in one week requiring designers. And, and we cannot just cut the designer half and help, help both projects, right? We have to level the resources, okay? If you need a refresher, please look at the previous slides, okay, and sessions. But here's, a, here's a, the same slide. This is how you find the standard deviation. I like to find it. I enjoy finding it. And the reason is I, I really enjoy finding this because I put this here, right? And this is already known, right? You put this here. And then who gives me this? Who gives me this? 120. So your boss gives this one, right? And say, okay, how about I give you 13 more days? I expect you finish 120, one, one hour, whatever is this, one, 100 days and 120 days or hours or whatever, right? So this boss gives me, so, I like to know this, which I can find. I know this one already, right? From the historical values where we started before the PERT, you know, we had the Simpsons rule and everything. And then when Bas tells me a number, I can look it up. And I can tell them something mathematically. They don't need to know what I'm doing, but they want my result to be credible and doable, achievable, right? So I got to do those things. And we'll look it up in Z table. 
Okay. So, CEO will also say, can you complete it earlier? Can you do it quicker? Right? Ah, now it's it's tricky. Right? Can you complete it earlier? What do I need to do to complete it earlier? And we alluded this a little bit at the end of the previous session. What can I do to complete it earlier? I can delete some tasks if I can. Right? I can, uh, what else can I do? I can change some nature of some of the tasks, right? I can give more time if I have. I can add more people if I can. Yep. Make people work longer hours. Oh, I don't like it. Because then there will be accidents. There will be injuries. Okay. So that is tri tricky. Okay. How quicker can you deliver? We also know this a little bit. Is there a duration where you can deliver 100% on time? What do you need to make it faster? I, I like the CEO, really. Look at this. She's even asking, what do you need to make it faster? Nobody asked this question. <laughs> People think that I have a magic wand and then I can do it like Harry Potter. Right? We don't. We know the tools and techniques. We have we have the knowledge in the background, math. Maybe you are using some project management software, some simulation, but no one has a magic wand, okay? What do you need to make it faster? Oh my goodness, this is the best CEO. I guess he owns a bank or something, okay? He wants to give me some money or some people, you know? Excellent. I like I like this question more, but... I'm cautioning you. You're not going to hear this more often. <laughs> you rarely hear this. Even though you ask this question, they will not hear it. <laughs> okay. They will listen to you, but they will not hear you. Do you know the difference between listening and hearing? And plus understanding, right? So, yeah. You're not going to get this one much. Okay. But even though the CEO doesn't ask us, what do we need? What do we need to do? So say the CEO is not asking this, okay? She's not asking this. What do we need to do? I'm just doing this so that you remember, okay? Just exaggerating a little bit. It's not because I don't like drawing. I, I like drawing, but I'm just exaggerating a little. Okay, she's not asking this question. What do we do? Maybe we are into the program, like we are already, we are already completed some activities. Maybe we are halfway, right? That's when the schedule compression comes into play. Like that's when we start talking about it in the meetings, right? Because in the beginning, we do the PERT and everything and we plan out. But schedule compression is not something that we need. We talk in the beginning. It comes up when we need it. Okay, so what we show, what I told you in the part, right? When you are c coming up with the durations of activities, please put some buffer because your manager will put some buffer, the company will put some buffer. So you have your buffer built in in your final delivery day. Oh, but don't tell others. Don't tell even your team. Like maybe your team is okay, like, <laughs> but others don't say you have a buffer. Okay, because then people will will eat it out will eat up your buffer okay okay she's not asking us what do we do okay uh, let's say i'm your ceo okay i'm asking can you quick can you complete it earlier boom you answered it how quick can you do it boom you answered it because you know the math right you have the pert and everything the expertise is there a duration that you can deliver 100 percent on time for sure boom you answered it but the last question she's not asking She's not asking you, what do you need? What do you do? But what do we do? We go to doctor when we are, feel sick, when we feel sick. Right? I mean, nobody's asking every day if you are sick. And they don't need to. Okay? But if they are, if they want us to deliver it quicker, even though they don't ask, what do we need? We have to communicate. That's where comes the soft skill sessions, okay? So we have to communicate. We have to come. So 
so she asked us we went back to our team we did some you know tricks as you know and then we came up with we need ten thousand dollar in 10 more weeks in the next presentation to her in the company meeting we'll say uh, we are asked to deliver you know this quick or 100 percent for sure and we did the math and we we did our homework and boom here's the slide you know and, and some extra slides in case you have they have questions like put your uh pert in the extra slides like backup slides and put uh, your uh cost estimation cost calculation in the backup slides you don't need to show that just show it 10 weeks that's what we need ten thousand dollars that's what we need in order to make it happen and then ceo will say oh no 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 no! i don't have 10 weeks customer is waiting well if you if you don't have 10 weeks uh, we can't do it right so we have to communicate we have to communicate they don't they don't necessarily ask like doctors right? they don't call us every day and ask us if we are sick okay if they want you to complete it quicker you got to tell them what they need it because no manager will like someone who agrees with everything she says can you do it quicker he says yes we can well if you agree with everything that's not way to go you shouldn't agree with everything that shows that you don't trust in yourself you don't have the expertise you're just trying to keep your job <laughs> which you will be fired earlier sooner because people will really find out that you are a people pleaser and you're just saying yes to everything and you don't really have expertise and and scientific background to back up your judgments or your uh, calculations estimations they will quickly find out and nobody wants to walk with you anymore do you understand what i mean it's kind of like real life experience and everything i'm mixing up here okay all right so the moral of the story if they are not asking we gotta tell them anyways at resource leveling just look at your uh labor peaks and valleys i i put here labor but again it can be a lab it can be money right all these things and try to eliminate these peaks and valleys in your uh resource picture resource picture that's this is another picture okay it's not pert or anything now you're looking at your pert and deciding your resources and then trying to find out if if the designer is <coughs> booked multiple projects in one day or half day or whatever is we are the ideal situation right the ideal situation what is the ideal situation you don't want to spend any money right you don't want to uh cause a schedule slip is that right most probably things will cost more money things will cost more time which is schedule slip most of the time okay it's a small project or whatever yeah it's fine maybe not but bigger projects good projects it's gonna cause some things okay so it's your, your ceo needs you to come up with some expertise to tell them where to start right i uh i think it was steve jobs from steve jobs uh so one of the interview i guess he said uh we want to hire people we, we we are not hiring people to tell them what to do we hire people to tell us what to do okay we don't hire people to tell them what to do we hire people to tell us what to do that's why they hire you right to tell them what to do so let's say you understand your project needed to complete earlier things you will need more time and more money to compress it and maybe when i say time it may be tricky so i shouldn't say time because we're trying to schedule the time right like compress the schedule but more often than not end date moves out and additional costs are incurred so your ceo needs you to tell them where to start okay so they will say where do we start there's like 20 active i'm trying to get my mouse here wait my mouse yes so 
uh, I'm trying to, the project is installing the sprinkler system in my backyard, right? So what is this? This is WBS, right? This is WBS. So I got to design the yard. It takes four hours and that's activity 1.1. I gotta purchase supplies. I gotta acquire equipment, right? I gotta rent a trencher. I gotta, uh, what? This is not that one. I gotta also purchase tools, right? Another sub project is preparing the yard. I gotta clear the trash and weeds and fill holes and rake the yard, right? And then I, I gotta dig the trenches and you can see the numbers, right? And, and, and hours associated with it. Let's say I'm just doing this myself and my son. So, yeah, these are the, the things, right? WBS. Okay, good. So, this is the spurt for that WBS. Okay, for that WBS. You can see the critical path. What are those? What are the dashed lines? These are the dummy activities, remember? Dummy activities? Yeah. Anyways, uh, that's my part. And these are my activity durations, right? And I find out that this red is the critical path. So, <clears throat> so that's my resource leveling based on that part. Okay, that part. That's what you need to do. So here's what it is. So designing the yard. Let's look at this one. Designing the yard four hours right and then uh purchasing the materials it's it takes me two hours but this empty boxes mean it's slack time right it's it, in this picture it shows the slack time for example rent the trencher i can rent it here it, it takes just one hour hop hop in the car or bike to home depot and then get it right one hour so I can get it in this time, or this time, or this time, or this time. I I can't do this here because the other activities are starting. Right? I gotta I gotta dig the trench, dig with a trencher to get the trencher to dig with a trencher. I gotta purchase it if I don't have it. Right? Let's assume I don't have it. That's why it stops there. So you have the slack time to move forward and backward a little bit. That's where we will use our resource leveling. Okay? That's how we will do it. So let's take a snapshot, okay? <clears throat> so it's me and my 14 years old son, okay? So let's take a, a snapshot. This is the fourth hour of the project, right? So what I did over here in the, in the box, like a Tetris, right? What I did is, looking at the labor this is one hour labor okay basically one cube cube is one hour one square is one hour labor so when i had take a snapshot for the third hour of my project and i just brought everything down as one square right because there's only one here i just collapse that one down do you understand what i mean uh, let's take let's take this one 23rd what's happening i want to see what's happening in the 23rd hour of my project okay me and my son is doing and every square is a manpower a, a, a labor 23 what's happening here look there is one hour labor here one hour labor here one hour labor here and as you can see i have three blocks over here what does that mean two people working at this project I have three cubes collapsed on that resource uh, data, let's say. More labor is needed than you have. Yes, I need three labor hours. I have only two because it's me and my son. Let's say my son does something and I do another thing. Let's say, what is it? Connect to water is this one. Install the timer, install the pipe and fittings, right? Let's say I do the connect to H, uh, water, connect to water, and my, my son does the install the timer. Who does the installing the pipe and fittings? There's no one to do it. Right? So what do I do at this time, 23rd? Well, 
if I move this block, let's let's erase this. If I move this block because this is the select time, right? The empty squares are black uh, select times. So if I move this box over here like this, what happens to twenty third? Now there will be only two blocks, which I move this one. So now my son can do install the timer and I can do install the pipes, right? Everything is on track. But if I don't see that such, if I don't move from my PERT to resource table, I, I can't necessarily see it. But are we done? No, because now I have a problem over here. Again, I move this, right? So I move this, I have three, I need three people here as well. Not, not necessarily three people, three labor hours. Okay. Well, then what do I do? I may move this to here. Then 24th is good. I will be two. But this time here, I, I will need one more. If you move it over here, I guess, right? Delete this. Now collapse this. It collapses to two. This is go. This is gone. This is gone. How many hours here? Two, two, even here. Even here, it's two, right? Even here, now I need another one, but that's fine because my son can do it, right? My son can do it. I will have another one. Uh, I, do, I will not need anything else. So this is fine. The rest is fine, right? Did you see how I eliminated this peak? That's an easy example, but that's basically the philosophy of it. But how you do it, it's not as, as easy as, as this. Okay. But you got this one, right? You you got the resource leveling idea. So you you look at the labors and then you look at your lab or designer, how many hours she's booked, and then you try to use the select time to make it. Why do I use the select time, guys? Why do I, for example, this one? Can I move this or this anywhere? Because of this, let's move, fill the holes and rake the yard. And you will say, no, sir, no, ma'am, we can't move it because then it's going to delay the project, huh? If you, if you are okay with it, we can move it because there are activities in the, uh, on the critical path that we can do it. Okay. Good. So explaining is explaining. I, I explain, I try to explain everything that I know to my managers. Why? Why you want to explain everything you can to your manager? Whenever you get a chance, even sometimes when they know it, they don't need it. Why do you want to explain them? Little by little, not teaching, but yeah, little by little. It helps them understand your decisions. It builds up trust. You should trust her, right? Okay. And they will also say, uh, they, you, you will also educate them. And next time when they ask, they will ask you more intelligent questions, more questions that will challenge you as well. They will challenge you and then overall productivity will increase, right? They will challenge you and say, okay, that's why asking questions is very, very important. So you will educate them. You will build trust. Uh, they will build trust on you. Uh, they will contribute to your decision. They will ask you intelligent questions and they will trust you. They will promote you. They will give you more project, more responsibility. Okay. And by the way, you are not always presenting one-to-one. -one. Usually these things happen in a larger meeting where the finance guys are there, marketings are there, and you will build trust to your department as well. Like you are in the quality department, in the manufacturing, wherever you are, people will say, oh, this manufacturing department is, is really good. This is some perception as well. So explain as needed, not everything, and not in the technical jargon. Explain simple terms, okay? Explain. What if, if that is not enough? If, if that's not as, as easy as this? So we talked about it a little bit. So then compress your schedule, which means you can delete some uh, parts, right? You can substitute them. You can paralyze some activities. You can shorten them. Look at the activities, why they are so long. You can say, I can this, I can do this seven weeks. 
I can reduce it to six weeks and I don't need any, any money because it, this is, this was already your buffer, right? So that's good. For example, <clears throat> let's go back to my, I mean, so, uh, let's, uh, let's go. So, for example, acquire equipment and tools. If you please observe carefully here. Look, I gave two hours, two labor hours to renting the trencher, purchasing the tools. Well, maybe I, maybe if, if I decide to go one shop and buy everything at one time, maybe I can reduce this one hour, right? And I can combine these two tasks over here because I can, instead of going both shops, I can go one shop and just buy everything there. Okay. Parallelization of activities. We'll see that and shortening them, adding more resources. Of course, who, who doesn't like resources? We should give them off Monday or something. Like we have to tell them we need you now, but we will compensate your time later. But we shouldn't necessarily make them work 15 hours for one week. That's not good. Yeah, just get ready for risks and injuries and death, okay? Then you crash the project. Crash the project, okay? Do you think there are risks to compression? Sure, that's what we talked about, it, right? The quality, the errors, people will make errors, right? Customer scope, you're going to scope, uh, maybe uh, skip some scope questions. Maybe you are designing a website and the customer doesn't really see the speed or the how clunky is the clumsy is the uh the software running in the background they don't really feel those things and you can make some tricks there but that's not good right in the long term they're gonna start complaining additional resources who doesn't right rework and safety if you are anybody's quality expert yeah quality is a big thing you will rework and there will be safety issues jobs people will leave your company Right. If you always work like this, if they have another choice, they will go for it. Understand the crash and cost relationship. What do I mean here? It's, it makes sense. Like if you put more money, I guess, right? You can complete it earlier. You can shorten the activity probably, right? You can just hire another designer on the spot, like a contractor for a week, and then they can work together and then you can compress the, the work, right? So cost and and crashing relationship and maybe some some activities completing them early will cost a lot of more money so if you want to complete them earlier some of them will require a lot of money when some others of the activities will not require that much money so that's where you will advise your ceo hey we should start from this activity because of that okay so for example two things one is uh crashing one is fast tracking so in the schedule compression umbrella there's two things one fast tracking the other one is crashing fast tracking is basically if you have dfg like this you move to this so what we do is now we do f and g in parallel hoping that we complete the work earlier. We reach the E, which is the destination, the delivery earlier, right? In the previous one, F needed to wait D, G needed to completion of F, right? But in this picture, when you are done with D, F and G start, and then hopefully they, they, they work in parallel, they are done in parallel, and then they, that's why they complete, the project completes earlier. That's fast tracking. That's fast. So we're not necessarily putting more money. We're not necessarily, uh, you know, getting more designers or anything. Just like, just like I did, you know, I can move this over here and now my son and I can do it. Right? We don't need anyone else. So that's fast tracking. So basically what I did in the sprinkler example was fast tracking. Okay. It can be, uh, more complex though. It can be more complex. Usually red shows us the critical path. Okay. When you just add the critical path, you got, you got the final, uh, duration, which is 33. So which activities make sense to fast track? Why do you want to complete some of them earlier? Which one of them? If you can, 
where do you look first? Yes, critical path. You want to look at the activities in the critical path, on the critical path. Why? Well, it's very obvious by now because if they are delayed, the project will be delayed. Well, by the way, guess what? If you complete them earlier, the project will be delivered earlier. And that's what the CEO wants it, right? So they want to complete it earlier. So uh, first thing I want to look at it is the critical path. So that, so that if I can see which ones can I complete earlier with less money, probably, hopefully, right? It's, it's not, it's the company's money, but still, right? Your performance needs to be good to spend less money anyways. So you look at the critical path, look at which one is less costly, and you can actually uh, shorten more. I mean, if you want to spend a spend thousand dollar and schedule compression one day, well, instead of that, you want to spend one thousand dollar on another activity on the critical path and maybe compress it two days. Well, same money, same result. Well, better result really and shorten more. And so the project duration will be shortened more. So look at the critical path. Which activity can you uh, complete very early, like earlier than others and less money? Okay. So to do that, what do we need to do? Well, we got to know how much is it now and how much will it take to crash it how much will it cost to track it, uh, crash it right so please tell me how long is this project 10 seconds 10 9 8 7 6 5 4 3 2 1 yes 23 okay good uh where would you start if if does it change the length of the project the duration of the project if a new activity g is added between c and e with a duration of 24 hours this is in days by the way okay the the, the part is in days i want to add an activity between c and e which will last 24 hours how much of a schedule slip will be observed if yes everyone says no so the this is something like that right so I just add this here, and that's a dummy activity. E needs to be done. Yeah, G needs to be done before E starts, okay? So it doesn't affect, okay. In terms of crashing, what do I need to know? Well, I got to know how much is at each activity. That's why WBS, now go back to your, now go back to your WBS, and then see what, you, what was your original estimates, and put them here, right? And... And PERT is not identical to your WBS, so you need to do a little bit work. Like activity A may contain a few items from WBS, so add them up and then write it here. Okay, so it's not identical, so you need to do a little bit intermediate work, intermediate work to come up with this. So attach dollar amounts, attach dollar amounts to each activity. Okay, so that's what we need to do. I'm not going to show you how to do it. So you can do it just looking at the WBS. But another thing we need to do is we need to know how much we can compress that activity and how much will it cost, right? So these are the numbers that you need to obtain, you need to gather, you need to have. How much is the activity now? How much can I compress this activity? How much would it cost me to compress it? Uh, we gotta know this. So in your project, you gotta know how much will it cost you now? How much will, how much can you compress? And how much will it cost you to compress? Uh, because you wanna know where to start. That's what the CEO is asking. He wants to know where to start. Okay. Because he's really keen on delivering it earlier because of another company. Uh, you know, creating this similar product and everything. So you got to get this table from somewhere. I'm giving you now here this, but in real life, you are the one to create this if they don't know.
you got to come up with this table. Okay. So what do I have in this table? So I have the activities over here, which are A, B, C, and D, like in the previous slide. Okay. And these are the critical path because I put it in red, right? I put them in red. And I already know how long do they take, right? Because that's how I did the WBS and how I did the PERT and how I found out the select time and I how I found out the uh, delivery, project overall delivery time deliver duration but I, I didn't think about the cost at that time much right because PERT only gives me the schedule not the cost but now my CEO is asking to make it shorter deliver it in, in quicker so I need to think about cost so what I need to know here is what did I tell you how much can I compress and how much will it cost me okay so let's see so let's say I can crash time four down to two right five down to i mean six down to five seven down to five six down to three so you cannot just make it zero right i mean there will be some physical things that you need to do right that's why you have this crash time maybe the the test the simulation is running for a week you never know. Maybe somebody needs to fly somewhere, make me, it will take time. So that means I can do uh, four down to two, six down to five, seven down to five, six down to three. Why am I not bothering with C and D? Well, I am bothering with them too, right? I can, I can do two down to one and two down to one. Okay. So, and this is my crash cost. What what does that mean? When I crash this, let's say activity A, when I crash it from four to two, my cost will increase from 10 to 14. When I crash B, I can do from six weeks to five weeks. And it, normally it's $30,000. Now it's gonna cost me $42,500. I mean, as I said, norm, you know the activity names, you know the times, you need to get this one. You probably know the normal cost as well, and you get you need to get this one. These are the things that we got to gather from the company. And this one that I blocked is, that one is crash cost per week. And how do I find it? Well, it was normally 10000 for activity A we're speaking. When I crash it, it's 14,000, 4,000, right? I need 4,000. Well, what's the crash per week then? 4,000 divided by two, it's 2,000, right? Let's check B. How many weeks am I saving? One week. How much money am I spending to save one week? 12,500. So what's my uh, cost per week? It's 12,500. Where do we start? Now with all this data, I think you have enough information to tell your CEO where to start. C is not critical. Yeah, that's the answer. C is not critical. You can, I mean, <laughs> you can, but if you tell your CEO to start with C, you're going to be fired. You can still crash if you have money, right? I mean, so where do we start? From A. Next, where do we go from A? F. Where do we go from F? E. Where do we go from E? Okay. Where do we go from B? I would check as I go. I would check if they are still in the critical path, on the critical path. Well, they, they will be probably. Personally, I would not suggest my CEO going for C and D. What is the reason that I'm doing this? Why should you never say CEO? to crash CND. Normally, my recommendation is always advise the positive things. When I say negative things to my students, for example, we can if we want, and the activities will be shortened. Yes, we will see an impact in the activities. If he asked me to complete the project earlier, I did everything, and CND, I can still do it, but it's not impacting my project duration, so it's not answering his question. Why do I spend the company money 
if it's not helping me. So can we plot this? It's fun to plot this. Okay. So normal operations, this cost us $120,000. $120, and let's say we're in the 15th week right now. Or, or this is, oh, yeah, only look at the normal operations. So normal operations cost is 120000 which is basically, if you add those things up, that's 120 okay? So I plotted that one for you. So where do we start? This is the 23rd week, right? Which I am assuming, we, we calculated the project will be delivered. Now my CEO is pushing me to, hey, I have money. Help me spend this money and help me deliver the project earlier. Okay? Okay. So the first thing we tell him, let's crash A because it's the cheapest. We still save two weeks. If he says, I have, I need, he can say, I have more money or he can say, I need to be delivered quicker. Okay, boss. Then let's go with F because F is cheaper too. And also it saves us some time. Are you happy with 18 weeks and possibly $135,000? If he says, no, I need more time and I have money, then let's crash E. If he still wants to go, let's crash B. Although it's the most expensive and it saves only one week, well, he needs it, so he will pay for it. Okay? So minimum cost total crash is $160,000. Where is CND? There is no CND. I can do it. If I crash all activities, I will spend more money like here. The cost will increase, but the time will remain constant. The project duration will remain constant. So why do I spend companies money? Unless they want to crash that C or D and get the designer loosened there, like get that designer from there because it's completed later and put her somewhere else. That may be a legitimate reason, but it's we are not addressing uh, the project duration. If they need to complete for whatever reason, then we can do it, but it's not impacting our project time here. But it's increasing my cost. Okay. What does this graph tell you? We already talked about it. It tells us a lot of stuff. A lot of stuff. If I have this slide and explain this in two minutes to my CEO, he will just tell me, yeah, this is great. I mean, that's the whole entire picture. Let's start with A and then we will start, right? We don't need any delayed decision. Okay. So just one more thing before you go. Why are we doing all these things? Because we are moving forward, because we need to update the plan, because we need to consider risks. Risks. And we will start two or three sessions about how to think of risks in a project environment. Because doing all these things are risky and we got to understand what's happening. You basically completed the overall picture of how a project is run. And then we will talk about risk. Now you know how to kick off the meeting. What is the process? What's WBS? What's PERT? What's the schedule? How can we update the schedule? How can we add activities, delete activities? How can we deliver it quicker? How should we think of the money, the cost? Today, the uh, project management review, but really not a lot. I'm just going to pass quickly. Definitions, steps, RM steps, which will, I will remind you the video again. Risk assessment, and I'm going to give you two tools, risk impact, impact metrics, and we'll do hands-on activities, okay? Okay, remember this one? So this we talked about the project management, but if you look at really from a risk management, this picture is full of risks. What are some possible risks in this project? This is about project management, right? We, we talked about it. But now, put on your risk goggles and look at from a risk perspective. What do you see here? Project team leader, customer, everybody misunderstands it. So that's a huge risk. That customer will not contract with you one more time. They will just stay away from you. Okay? 
because you did not make a, enough effort to understand them because customer doesn't know the technology. They don't have to know it. They don't have to know the international standards. They don't know, have to know the electrical engineering standards. Uh, they don't have to know the laws, right? Uh, city permits, uh, all these things. They don't have to know, right? They, you have to understand the customer really good. Requirements creep. There's also requirement creep risk, right? All these things are risk. And we never, never talked about them. We talked a little bit about it in the part. Just upfront, when you become a leader, I always ask your team, okay? What are the risks? Just ask them, did you consider the risk? That'll make a huge leap in your plans. Whoever is presenting you anything, okay? Just ask them as a leader or as a team member, it doesn't matter. Uh, did we consider the risk? What are some possible risks, right? When you ask this question to your team, so next time when we come to meeting, we want to make sure that we say something about the risk, we'll, which will be a, a huge leap in the planning and execution as well. Ask them, what about the risks? What are we doing about the risks, right? And always remember, did you consider the risk? Did you consider the risk? You will see the great change in your team and their planning, okay? Because leaders should ask good questions. Because if you don't ask good questions, it shows that you don't know enough. People who don't ask questions, believe me, they don't know it. If they knew it, they would ask questions. Okay? So always ask good questions. And, and one of them, I want it to be risk. Okay? <clears throat> A project, you know it already. We can go from there. But when we think about the triple constraints, time, scope, and cost, of course, there are risks involved in all of them, right? We talk about the PERT and the critical path and what should project manager do, which which activities should she consider, you know, the risk and how, where she should be. So all these things. But there's also an extended version of uh, the constraint in a project. And one of them is risk. That's why I chose risk here. Okay. Risk. This is like, an individual, a, a separate, a standalone, okay, risk. Uh, but I want to ask you, have you ever taken any risks? Because we talked about uncertainty, right? But sometimes there are certain things and we embrace them. Have you ever taken any risks? Anyone? Have you ever avoided any risks? The thing that I want everyone to remember about risk, risk is not always negative, right? Of course, there may be opportunity costs Those for those who know what it is. There will be opportunity costs for you. For risk appetite is what we say. So you risk your money, uh, like you some said, investment, and then you hope to get some rewards, right? You hope to get some rewards. Of course. Risk definition. So let's study this because this is very important. If you understand this, you will understand everything about risk. So risk is an uncertain event, right? Somebody already told me uncertainty, right? Uncertain. There is uncertainty, but again, there, there is certain things that we embraced, right? And then uh, if occurs, what does that mean? Occurs. So sometimes it doesn't occur. We just think about the risk, we take it in our plans, but it doesn't occur, which is totally fine, right? Know this, it may have positive or negative. So that's what I was gonna, I was saying. Risk is not always negative. Sometimes risk is positive as well. And you know what? We don't care about risks if they are not impacting our project objective. That's why I said the risk is related to the project management because anything you consider risk should be one of your project objectives. If it's not, that's not a risk for you. So whatever is your project objective, you, you have to consider that objective to find out the risks. So even though there is congestion, it's not a risk for me right now. But if I need to go there and there is a congestion, then there is a risk, that's a risk that I need to consider. 
anything other than your project objective is not a risk for you. Well, there may be secondary risk, but yeah. Because if the next, if the, if there's a fire next next room or next house, may may impact me as well. So some of the things that we already alluded in our discussion. So risk is not always bad. Identify early in the process. That's why the first one is risk identification. Identify early in the process. Always think about possibility and impact. Okay, what can go wrong? what should go right if you are a team member okay if you're a team leader always ask your team what can go wrong what should go right so always ask your team these questions and the steps is identification like this baby first gauge how how high is the bed and he decided he can't do it that's identification and assessment okay risk response development which we will talk more next time. Memorize this like this, IADC. It's always easier to remember. That's actually So IADC is a good one, okay? Remember it that way. In your interviews, you can always say, oh, risk management has four steps, IADC, and then, and then continue explaining them. So this one, uh, risk identification, you come up with your risks. So when you start identifications, you come up with your risks. Actually, a tire hitting me, someone hitting me, or a student on a on a vehicle, right? Hitting me, a, a car hitting me is more probable, right? So, what are your risks in risk identification? You come up with those things, and then risk assessment. Of course, a tire can hit me possibly, but nothing will happen, right? And it's a slim chance. So, after your risk assessment, what you do is risk severity and likelihood. And can you control the risk? So you come up with these things. And then you have now a risk assessment plan. And then you develop your risk response strategies. Now you want to develop a strategy. That's a strategy. And develop contingency plans. What can we do? What else we can do to mitigate this risk? Okay. And then when once you have a risk management plan, now you implement that. And then you monitor that. Why you have to manage, monitor? Because some risk today may not be your risk tomorrow. Or some things that are not risk today may be a risk for your project objective tomorrow. So you always need to think about it. So implementation, monitoring, and controlling is very important. So we already know uncertain and we need to think about the effects. So effects can be negative and positive. Okay, remember that? So when it's positive, we call it them opportunity, like not still opportunity. And the other one is threat. Okay, threat. So then it's negative. So risk is a function of likelihood and impact. We have been talking about this today, right? So likelihood, impact, probability, consequences, some textbook and some domains we'll talk about as, as results. Okay, so let's think about a scenario okay so there's a house single family house and the owner does hate mice okay and there are a few mice in the house so she puts up some uh, mouse traps around the house okay and in the house there's really hungry mouse whenever He's, it, the mouse is hungry, goes out and looks around, and then uh, now the mouse seizes the cheese, right? Mouse cheese on a mouse trap or cheese looking thing on a mouse trap, okay? So it, the mouse is really hungry, okay? And the mouse needs to eat something, which may be this cheese looking thing, okay? What can be some of the threats? that in this risky situation the mouse needs to consider okay i will give you two minutes everyone to think about it what are the threats so if the mouse tries to eat that one reach that thing what might be some of the possibilities and outcomes okay hurt injured or killed uh by and hurt he might get trapped 
he might get some chunk of food and he might get both food and escape, okay? And assessment and risk response development and control, right? IADC. So probably maybe the house owner lady, maybe he, he purchased like with with other like smell, you know, cheese smelling, maybe a kind of a rock thing like this. When you are dealing with risk and trying to identify the risk, we got to try to escape from all assumptions, right? So this might not be a food in the first place. So let, how do you test this? If Because you don't want to break, I mean, the mouse doesn't want to break his teeth, right? How can you test the waters like the baby did? Yeah, maybe then the that is, it's going to snap on, on you probably. But you, you can find the stick and poke with a stick. Cheese, probably the stick will get in. If it's like a rock, probably the stick will not get. Because if we come to the table with all of our assumptions, we will be heading the wrong route. We have to consider everything uh, and start from scratch like for identification, right? Uh, it's not only mouse. Your Our project objective is eating that, I understand. But going to there... Maybe the lady is waiting for us, right? Probably she contaminated, right? Some, not only cheese, but some mouse uh, contamination around the mouse trap. So you can't even reach to the cheese if it's a cheese. Okay. So we have to consider all these risks. Possibility of it being poisoned. Yeah, you can break your jaw, break your teeth, right? And even maybe contaminated and poisoned by by cheese looking thing or maybe it's a cheese but maybe some poison injected in the cheese right i mean all kinds of risks is there and just like in life right every day you get into your car every day you basically race for the day and you don't know what's going to happen during the day in terms of risk right don't be paranoid but some risk we should be paranoid right we have to think about the homeowner waiting for us with an umbrella we have to be thinking about the contamination the poison that not being cheese all these things are risk identification right and assessment also like bring a friend or look for the lady in the kitchen right use a stick all these things are valid assessment risk response strategies how can we do this and then controlling of course so the moral of the story is Always think about uh, get rid of your assumptions and try to, you know, search for all the risks around the platform, not only the cheese. Okay, not only the cheese. So that's a that's a skill. That's a big skill. Okay. So that that was a little exercise for us to think about risk and risk assessment. Uh, so you got, for example, after the risk identification, you you come up with five risks, right? Cheese not being the cheese, maybe a rock, uh, maybe a stone, maybe a, a poison injected cheese, lady waiting for. So we have all these risks, let's say five risks, right? So what do we do? Well, we try to assess them. Which one is more likely? Which one is more impactful? Right? We gotta consider those things. So that plays in the second step risk assessment. Okay. We wanna quantify the risk so that we can prioritize them and then we can take, we can consider strategies. We can uh, develop strategies. Okay. Because we will do something within our budget, within our timeline, within our resources. Okay, so we got to prioritize them. Even though you have five risks for that mouse, probably it can only attack three of them or two of them, not all of them probably, right? So that assessment helps us. So, and then how do we aggregate the risks? We do uh, probability times consequences and add them up. You know, this means basically P, P1, C1, you know, plus this is times P2, C2, plus P3, C3, right? And then you add them up, and then you have the aggregate risk, overall risk, right? Overall risk. That's first equation in the risk management that we need to know.
probability times impact. Remember, from the start of this lesson, we always talk about probability and consequences. Then how do we assess and prioritize? Well, we look at the probability and consequences, and then we multiply them, and then we prioritize them. Okay? If if that's not, if that composes more parts, then we simply calculate risk for each part and then add them up. Okay? Add them up. That's how we do the risk. That's new for here. Risk assessment. So let's say you have a machine, right? Energy generation unit. Uh, that's how we should understand. So it's a big, big unit, right? It's a big, big unit. So energy generation unit generates too little power once in a year, and the cost is 5000 per incident. Okay. Well, as you can see, it's just once, but the, the cost is not really high. When energy generation unit generates too much power to be controlled, it's happening five in a thousand, which is very rare. But when it happens, now you need to spend one million dollar. Okay, ECU fails twice a year. Each time it's five thousand dollar. It's okay. Loss of power happens five in a thousand times a year, but you have to spend one million. Right? Look at this. So you gotta spend ten million dollar, but it happens only once in a thousand in a year. Right? How do you aggregate this whole machine, like whole unit? Your boss is asking, what is the risk of this machine with all the units, considering all the units, what's the overall risk? And how do you calculate this? You got to give them a number, right? And that's uh, exactly what is happening here. P times C, right? So, one time five thousand plus uh zero zero five times one million right plus two times five thousand plus zero zero one times five hundred thousand and then plus zero zero five times one million and you aggregate them and then you found one number what is the overall risk in terms of money for this machine the system so now you have you have at least one tool right when you do this you have 45k so when your boss asks you okay what is the what is the risk of this machine failing and creating headache for me for this year and you say sir ma'am 45000 a year is our risk Okay, I am your boss, and you presented these numbers to me. What does that mean? Okay, mm -hmm. this machine would cost us 45000 a year. So what do you mean, really? What do we mean? So if I give you 45000 today, would it be enough for you? Or how much should I give it to you today? Or what do you want, really? You're saying you're showing me 45000 but it may cost more. How much do you want today? So I can, I can tell my finance department, to transfer you the money you needed. And mm -hmm. uh, you're saying loss of ETU, which is energy transfer unit, costs you one million. How come you want just seventy seven thousand? And what if this happens? Would you come back to me and ask for money? That's the uh, that's the difficult part. Okay? Mm -hmm. I completely understand. I don't have that answer as well. Mm -hmm. So which means uh sometimes it's good to insure the machines just get an insurance company who would be interested in these numbers so as engineers we think that whenever we calculate a number our job is done our job is not done we have to tell others what we need what is good for the company these numbers they will not make sense for those guys okay how much should be asked because this is a real situation right we are in a meeting CEO is there and he's asking me, how much do you want today? I can transfer your, your project budget. It's very risky, right? It's very difficult. But who is interested in these things? Not only company, outside the company. How about your sponsors? How about your investors? Maybe someone wants to buy this machine or uh, uh, acquire your, your company, right? 
maybe you're a startup or something, they want to acquire you and make you bigger. They will be interested in those kind of numbers because you don't, you probably don't have only one machine. If there's five machines like this and it takes hundreds of thousands of dollars just to maintain them, maybe they will invest to another company. Right? Investors, stockholders, yeah. Insurance companies, that's a good one. They would want to know this number. Why? Because they're going to underwrite it, right? They're going to create a code for you and this code should include this. Yeah, to design their policy. They want to know this number. They don't want to charge you less for a huge risk. They want to charge you enough because when this happens, now they're just, you're just going to call them and get them fix it or you will fix it and get the money or something, right? How, however it works. They're going to underwrite this policy. So they will, they will design the policy such. That's why home insurance companies, uh, but they ask like, do you have a garage for cars? Is there a fire, uh, you know, fire, uh, alarms? If, is there, do you have a backyard? Uh, is, is this in a flooding zone? They ask all kinds of stuff, right? To design their policy. They want to know all these things. So, uh, why would you accept risk? Sometimes we accept risk because it's not safe at the risk. It's not security. It's very low probability, like a tire hitting us in my neighborhood. It's very, very low. That's why I don't care about it, right? Uh, maybe we have a risk appetite to, you know, historically accepting the risk anyways. But, uh, how can we formulate and structure these strategies that about the mouse, right? These are my strategies. Use a stick. Attempt to capture the cheese in collaboration with another fellow mouse. That's also what, something that I thought. Just attempt the cheese without thinking of getting poisoned or anything. Use another mouse for testing the trap. Do not eat it. Just change the plan, right? But how can we formulate these things? What, what we call the third step risk response strategies, okay? And those are these, and we will cover them in a scenario next. I want to focus on just one thing today, risk response strategies, which is the developing risk, risk responses. It is the third step, right? Risk identification, uh, risk assessment, risk response developments, and then control right risk control so we have four steps in in some resources you may have one or two more steps they kind of make it a little bit fancier uh so but it's basically four and then we will do hands-on activities and who care about risk and now you can talk minutes about risk on this one okay so now you can see where are the risks right is there a risk of losing your customer here? Sure. They will probably not knock your door back again. They will go find someone else who can understand them, right? Uh, risk management sp steps, risk identification, right? Assessment, development, and control. So how I, how I did the acronym? IADC, remember? IADC. So, how do you identify risk? Well, you ask people, right? You look at the historical data, you, you, you rely on your experience, on others' experts' experience. You read articles, you follow news, right? You can come up with risk identification. Why do we need risk assessment? Why do we need risk assessment? To see if the project is worth doing. So is the project worth doing or risk worth taking or something? Because project is already going on, right? So risk is something that may impact your project objectives. So your project is already going on. So you may decide to take the risk or not. Right? But the project is, is continuation of everything. So it's, it's, you are in that part. And doing project already, but sometimes risk pops up, or you 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 figure out that there will be a risk, and then you think, is it worth it, 
or not or what do I do? Today we will discuss about what do we do about it. So if they are not implementing your project project objectives, fine, right? I think I gave the example like if I want to drive to Tempe right now. I mean, no, if there's a congestion, my regular route to Tempe right now. But I'm not going there. Is it a risk for me? No. But if I have a 12 o'clock course or meeting there, a class and meeting, and I need to drive right now, if there's a congestion right now or an accident or something like that, then I'm worried because now it's risk for me. Okay. And we don't always take the risks. So some we we can avoid risks and we can do we can mitigate risks, right? There are different uh, strategies that we can develop. Quantification of the risk, because now you have, you know, 400 risks. Well, what are you going to do? Just cry out? No. You know, based on your time, based on your expertise, of course, your company's and project team's expertise, you know, you will come up with maybe maybe one, maybe three, maybe five risks that you will want to attack, address, mitigate. Others you will monitor, but possibly not take action. Even though you want to take action, maybe, you will not have resources. Okay? You will not have resources. Priority. Yeah, I like the quantification and prioritization words in here because you want to quantify 400 risks and then after quantification there's a there's one first risk second risk third risk and then you want to prioritize them okay which ones are now for me urgent to attack okay prioritization and quantification i like that let's see uh and then risk control okay good so we looked at this one already. That if they are negative, it's threats. If they are positive, the impact is positive, right? The impact is positive or negative. We call threat negative, positive. We call opportunity. And then we worked on this mouse trap, right? Mouse trap. And then we did this one. How do we aggregate risks, right? And this is a big machine right a big energy generation unit and then uh how do we think of the risk overall risk on this and i wanted to cover this one so this one i want to cover today so risk impact metrics that's a very visual aid for us to explain some of the risks to our managers okay or, or ourselves or our team members but the managers are we use this more for the managers because it's quick, it's visual, it explains everything we need. And we can we can make our point on this one slide. Okay. Think of this as, as a slide in your slide deck for your project. Okay. How this works is uh let's you place the risks on this risk map. Heat some call heat map, uh risk impact matrix, we call it. Okay, so for example, uh, the situations we studied, let's think about the tire. A tire hitting me, uh, walking on the sidewalk, where do I mark it, right? Where do I put it in this matrix? This is, the, the X, uh, the Y is uh, probability, okay? So one, two, three, four, five, out of five, what is the probability? X axis is impact okay so think about it so a tire will hit me while i'm walking on the sidewalk texting right like in the video what is the probability yeah probably one right what is the impact probably one or maybe or if it hits me on the right side and i fall under a car right well yeah of course that's why sometimes uh, risk is not really easy to, to identify. So I would put like here. Okay. Like here. One, one. Okay. Remember a tire 
hitting the uh, door and and dis destroying everything. Some so what is the probability? Well, probability is maybe a little bit higher, right? Than a tire on the sidewalk, maybe two, three, right? Somewhere here, let's say three. Uh, because it's highway, every minute trucks are going, Ramada is always there. The chance is really high, right? Like three. What is the impact? I don't know, maybe two, maybe three. Not much, right? Not much. Well, it depends on where you are. The lady in the car was old and scared, but the people in the Ramada Inn were not really bad, right? But I want to put it maybe over here, right? Ramada Inn, I want to say, oops. Why is this bad? Ramada in, right? The risk of anyway, there's another risk, let's say, right? And then it's high chance, high probability, and high impact, right? Over here. Whatever it is. Right? So now you have of course others, let's say ten risks in your project, right? And then what happens is okay. So your manager, everybody in the meeting sees this one and then say, okay, what do you want to, what is your point? What do you want to say? You want to say whatever risk is in there in the, in the 25, 25 comes from five times five, right? So four times four, 16, three times three, nine, right? So you want to make your point and say, okay, I want, I want help with this risk, whatever is this. Okay. Whatever is this, I need help because it's high chance to occur and then high impact. So we want to make sure that this is not happening or if it, or else if it, if it happens, we want to make sure we're, we're ready, right? But it, it matters how much we are prepared. And that's why today I want to discuss that. What can we do to prepare and what, what is it called? So that's, that's a good heat map. Visual, visual aid, risk impact matrix. Okay, so these are the labels, titles of what are those risk response strategies. Okay. So see two sides. So threats and opportunities. What was the threat? The threat was when the impact was negative. So opportunity and threat. So this is two sides. Okay two sides but as you can see share is shared share is shared by both which one of the response uh, strategies are shared by both shared right so you can avoid the threat you can transfer it you can mitigate it and reduce fallback is also mitigation you can share it and you can accept it Okay, you can avoid, you can transfer, you can mitigate, you can share, you can accept. You are just about to graduate and then you delay your graduation for for one summer, I mean, uh, for for the May and then you're now graduating in December because you failed the class. What can go wrong in that one? Uh, what can go wrong? Because you delayed your semester, what can go wrong now? What's the likelihood, right? You want to come up with the likelihood. And then what are the consequences? So what is the likelihood? Well, I'm hoping everybody get a job. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, everybody can get a job offer hopefully before they, they graduate, right? So that's maybe 25%. And then what are the consequences? I'm sure many of you did this one because that's, that's our dream, right? Before you graduate, you want to land on a job. So what is the... Yeah, three months of salary, right? So giving up the opportunity is just three times, not not actually three. So you're not graduating in May. If you graduated, you would get a job, right? So you lose June, July, August, September, October, November, December, and you're hoping maybe they will accept you in the January, right? Or else maybe in, in seven months, they will find someone else. Seven, okay, seven times seven, right? 49k you lost what else what else can go wrong already going wrong because you already failed right more expenses yeah so housing right now you would have to stay with that roommate what is the chance
well, that's you have to stay, right? That I mean, if you want to change it, that's fine. Maybe a fifty percent. I want to say like ninety percent, but maybe you want to change roommates or something like that, right? I don't know. So that, and then how much is it? Yeah, ninety percent housing. What else? So maybe uh, you have to pay the class again, right? You will take the class again. Take the class second time. The course may not be available the next next semester. Right? That's the disaster. Take the class second time. What is the percentage? Probably, you know, full percentage. Unless if it's not offered, right? What can I think we can write here? Uh, the class, the course is offered in next spring. Oh my goodness! Now your graduation is delayed a year, right? What is the chance? Maybe fifty per. I don't know, fifty percent. Let's say fifty percent. So this. So whenever you talk with your management, they like to see in numbers, okay? So in your risks, always try to come up with numbers and then uh, try to make a, like a total amount, right? What is the total amount that you will need or you will lose or you will need maybe 50K, right? How about the emotional? Your friends are graduating, you can't. Maybe you wanted to go back to your country, you can't, right? Maybe you wanted to move to your uh, families, where they, wherever they are living, your mom, dad, whoever. Uh, you wanted to go there, now you can't. Maybe you would get married or... Had a... So emotional, you, we don't even count. We only look at the financial, right? So risk is a big thing in our life. Did you, any, did you take any risks this week? Think about your daily routine. Did you drive a car? Isn't that a huge risk? We don't really think about it, but getting in this box is itself scary. Right? It's really scary. So I see car accidents every day. It's, yeah, even getting on the highway is, is very risky. Restaurant, yeah. Did you eat in a restaurant? You may get poisoned. You don't know what is inside. But I want to come back to here, right? Are you worried about all these things every day? Probably not. Probably not. Because you trust city. You trust the business owner, right? Restaurant, they, you say, okay, they, they are very careful about the hygiene. Maybe there's a couple of restaurants that you always go trust, right? And you say, city gave them permits, so they should be inspecting them regularly, which is good, right? So it brings us to over here. You know, eating in a restaurant, it's a risk, but it's a risk here, right? It's a risk here. How about driving a car? Uh, maybe somewhere here or even here, right? So... But I forget to say the the uh, the colors here. The red is the 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 most prioritized one. That's very urgent, very uh, disastrous, impactful, very probable. So red is that. Yellow is we are monitoring, and we are ready to. We we, we have to consider some things there. Like we have to be ready. The green, we are just monitoring them. Okay, so. These are interested about those, right? Yeah. Why do we accept risk? Because we are not trained about risk. Actually, we're not accepting it. We're just blindly uh, embracing it. Like, we don't have a risk awareness. So we don't even think about risk, right? So we can say, I have nothing else to do. Nothing better to do, so we're going to do it. Maybe it's a very low probability. It's not a security risk, right? Nobody is dying. So it's, yeah, that's why you may be accepting. Getting in a car, driving. But how about airbag systems, right? We think that they protect us. They protect us. But actually, last decade, a thousand deaths attributed to airbags. So what does that mean is if there was there were no airbags, they would have survived. 
right? So whatever we do, we cannot eliminate the risk to zero, but we want to eliminate it to acceptable level, right? And think about millions of cars. So it says in a decade, so how many a, a year, a hundred? So one in three days, right? Is it acceptable? For me, none is acceptable. Even one person is not acceptable. But we're, we're talking about the trade-off with having airbags and not having airbags. So a thousand deaths having airbags, maybe 10,000 or 100,000 deaths without airbags, right? So even though you try to mitigate some risks, there is still risk, which we call residual risk. It's still there, residual risk, okay? Of course, they, they, they improve it all the time, right? They try to bring this number down. So the, all this kind of, like, we, we want to be very careful about those things. Okay, how about, how about seatbelt? It's very same. It's very similar. So with seatbelts, you get your chest bones broken, right? All this kind of stuff. But it prevents you dying, right? So it's, it's a different, it's a risk mitigation, but it's not making the risk zero. Yeah, betting in Vegas, flying in an airplane, driving in a car, they are all risks. And I'm sure some of you have, uh, some of you are in the cryptocurrency world. So Bitcoin and all these things. Yeah, so in this world, it's, it's also very risky, right? Every risk has, may have a reward, maybe not. So let's look into threat, right? Avoid transfer. I want you to know these by heart, right? Just memorize them. And then for opportunity, it's exploit, enhance, share, share is shared, and accept. Well, accept is also looking the same, but in opportunity, we call it reject because there's something positive and you're basically rejecting it, right? You're not accepting the positive. You're basically rejecting the positive by not doing it, right? By not doing it. So it's more a rejection rather than acceptance. So some, some resources you may see accept, accept. Some resources you may see accept, reject. And, and, and I am inclined to reject more because you're rejecting an opportunity by not doing anything. That brings us to risk response strategy. So we, we identified our risks. We have a long list of risks, okay? And then we assess them. We try to quantify them. Uh, that's also subjective, right? So what is the probability of a risk? Well, some can say 80%, I can say 50%, right? Uh, what is the impact? Some can say, hey, it's, you know, a thousand dollar. And some others can say, you know, 50 bucks. I don't know. It depends, right? But we got to find a number. We got to agree on a number, okay? Okay, risk response. And now the step three is risk response strategies. Okay, risk response strategies. So here's the big picture, okay? As, as, I, as you see, uh, there are, we covered the threats. You know, if the impact is negative, it's, it's threat. If the impact is positive, if you are gaining, earning something, you're gaining an opportunity, it's an opportunity, right? Threats are negative. Okay, so if we're, we're going we're gonna to come back to that. Risk response development strategies, okay? So for threats, okay, there's a few things that we can do. Avoid, we can avoid the risk. We can transfer the risk. We can mitigate the risk, okay? And in this mitigate, there is reduce and fallback. So it's kind of, this is one group, okay? I don't want you to be confused. So this is kind of like one group. So that if this is like one, two, three, this is kind of three A and three B, and this is four, and let's say this is five, okay? So reduce and fallback is kind of a subset of mitigate, okay? And for the opportunities, 
it's exploit enhance let me erase those it's exploit enhance share and accept share is shared share is shared between threat and opportunity except is basically the same okay except except so it's a kind of shared as well so the only difference is exploit and enhance but i'm going to focus on threat more today so i want you to use what i'm teaching what is it i want you to use this analogy okay you are crossing this old bridge okay it's not really looking good it's old you know there's if you fall it's very high you'll hit the rocks and everything okay so you'll probably pretty badly injured okay so think about you're crossing this bridge when when i'm discussing when we are covering the risk response strategies so avoid modifying the project to eliminate the threat entirely so what's the threat in remember we're crossing uh, the bridge this old bridge okay how can we avoid it so we can avoid it to eliminate by eliminating the threat entirely yeah that's what i want to say so <clears throat> you consider the risk and then you say i'm not going to cross that one well you walk up the hill a little bit maybe it takes 20 minutes longer but it's okay there's no risk right so when you change when you choose not to get it you are avoiding the risk so you're basically analyzing the risk you know what if i fall down i'm gonna die or badly injured so instead of that i'm not in a rush i'm just gonna walk up the hill and it'll walk 20 minutes and then go you know go across the so you're basically avoiding it how about transfer <clears throat> so shifting the negative impact and responsibility of risk response to a third party when when you see the transfer <clears throat> i want you to think about insurance companies and insuring your car your house okay so you're basically transferring the risk to someone else let's say you're gonna cross the bridge if you crossing the bridge and getting that water and coming back to that side you're basically <laughs> hiring a stunt let's say right or your friend you're paying your friend your stunt hey you know go cross that bridge bring that water to me i need that water you're basically getting someone cross the bridge for you but still bring the water to you okay that's what happens when we insure our houses and homes and cars and everything and and companies and machinery when you have a car insurance are you basically eliminating any probability of car making an accident are you decreasing the probability no well even whether or not you have the regardless of you have the car insurance or not well if you if you're gonna make an accident you're gonna make it right you're gonna get involved in an accident right it doesn't matter if you have an insurance or not well does it matter in, in terms of the impact well what is the impact if you make an accident if you is it different if you have an insurance or not so basically you're not you're not making any any changes you're not reducing the probability and decreasing the impact to the car but you're basically reducing the impact financial impact of what it causes you your budget okay so always think about insurance when you think about transfer mitigation now you are reducing the probability and or impact of the risk now you cannot reduce it probably to zero you may get close but to a tolerable level okay tolerable level so how can we apply this to our crossing the bridge analogy how can you reduce the probability of falling and hitting the rocks let's first think about the probability and then we will move into the impact how can you reduce the probability of falling and hitting the rocks right if you are in a group or something then then go one by one and, and maybe walk really really slowly and test first if the you know if the wood there is or or ropes i guess if they are not rotten or anything if they are still good and test it if one is bad maybe you can you know step a little bit wider to the next one what is what am i doing now I'm trying to reduce the probability of falling. 
okay just being a little bit more careful just going one by one is basically uh, maybe i can uh, you know i can have a hanger and whatever and then i can put the hanger to the bridge you know if if i can and then i can reduce the probability of falling and hitting you can still fall but maybe you don't hit the rocks how about the impact guys so there's a you remember the risk is probability and impact so by now impact so i fell i am gonna hit the rocks i want to decrease reduce the impact of the damage the injury how can i do that uh parachute is a good one and the other one is good too uh maybe you know if you're a little bit trained maybe you can at least hide your head to avoid concussion hide your head if if you can do that i don't know it, it requires a little bit training but for example soccer plays they always fall but they know how to fall so they reduce the impact right uh yeah so you can just maybe some i don't know if you have some protective gear or something just put them on right maybe you have some special uh a clothing or something helmet yeah helmet is a good one right you want to have a helmet how can we do acceptance anyways okay good so exploit uh i'm not gonna focus but i want you to know the opportunities so exploit is you're eliminating the uncertainty because now you're eliminating the uncertainty because you want to gain the opportunity right you're going to make more money you're going to get seize this opportunity whatever it is so if there's anything you know hindering your efforts and preventing you getting this opportunity you want to eliminate this uncertainty so that means exploitation exploiting enhancing is the increasing the probability and impact well when we are crossing the bridge it was a negative impact right well, i'm gonna hit the rocks and die but here it's an opportunity so i want to increase this time the probability it's the opposite direction of what we did in the in the threat okay so now we want to increase the probability and impact share basically you're sharing uh with a partner with a third party this time not to give give them the burden of you know when you have a car insurance a car accident all the financial burden goes to insurance company hopefully uh, this time you are sharing the opportunity with them okay with a third party and you're accepting basically yeah you know there's an opportunity but i don't know maybe you don't want it or if it occurs you're just gonna capture the opportunity okay so you're not really spending any resources to increase the probability you're not spending any resources to eliminating the uncertainty you're basically accepting it just like the just like we did uh, in the threats to talk about the security uh data hierarchy data hierarchy uh what's the our publicly available personal data that we need to protect what is phishing wishing and ransomware and i'll talk about my real life experience that happened to me actually uh, during COVID. uh yeah and i'll i'll talk about that, that one my personal experience oh i really want to go fast with the definitions you know security safety just being safe comes from french so it means safe so it's coming from french the condition of being protected when we talk about cyber security it's the the degree of protection the condition of being protected from hackers that are being stolen you know performance of our uh, it and other uh, assets when we say security risk management most of us understand only it services right but it's actually not security is very broad but most of us will understand even in the, in the companies they will understand the it okay the it but uh you have military too right you have border protection you have army navy all kinds of, these are security forces right you have police you know national guard security guards uh right these are security so security and being safe is not only it okay 
even a small can of mace, some can of mace that you have in your purse or your backpack or your bag really helps as well for your skill. Can of mace even helps to be secure a little bit, right? Can of mice will help, right? But why should we care about security? Well, this is kind of a, you know, continuation of the risk management lectures and also in your project environment, what kind of security risks you have, right? Especially personal data, public data of your project, your employees, your team members, right? So, so Time Magazine announced that, the, you know, the decade from hell, 21st century, first, first decade, they have a cover page saying the, the decade from hell, right? 11 attacks, anthrax issues, Enron disasters, right? The gas, and then hurricanes and floods in, in Florida, Texas, right? Global finance collapse, mortgage crisis, house crisis, 2008, whatever you want to say, right? And it was a really decade from hell. What type of security risks are there? For example, let's think about uh, Walmart, right? What kind of security risk Walmart has? You think of yourself as a, as a branch manager, store manager for Walmart. What kind of risks would you consider? Stealing items, yes. That's, a, that's why you will see people in the back of the t-shirt, it says loss prevention. And when you're stepping out, most of the Walmart, they have someone looking at you and saying bye. Well, then they're actually security guards. They're just checking you if there's anything suspicious, right? Uh, for example, do you shop at Costco? They check your receipt and make sure your item, number of items on your receipt is the same what you have in your cart. Okay. But most of the time it's for loss prevention. Okay. Announce them and report them to the government agencies when they when they are uh, a victim of cybercrime but they don't because of reputation purposes and a lot of stuff because of uh, risk of losing customers and bad reputation and stuff like that but but there is digital uh, cyber concerns too like someone get go to our database the walmart database right any company and then uh, they can get all of our information Walmart, what kind of information they have? I am, well, if you have a card, like a loyalty card, right? Uh, they have your name, physical address. They have your phone number, right? Uh, they have your credit card information. And you may think I'm just swiping, but there's a lot of cameras, right? When you just focus on someone's credit card, you can easily get the security code in the back and then the expiration date and then all these things, right? And for 10 seconds, looks someone's credit card. It's not really difficult, right? For someone who wants to do it, who wants to do it, right? Birthday too, birthday too, right? So what are they going to do with all these things? Uh, they do a lot of stuff, always the event. Especially social, social security, like credit cards. If you, if you see a $500 uh, transaction, you can just delete or reverse that transaction. Banks usually give it back to you. They stop your credit card. They call you instantly. They, they do all kinds of good stuff. But if someone got your SSN, so never ever write your social security card. If your identity is stolen, you will spend tens of thousands of dollars, maybe more, and then five, ten years. It, it's, it takes sometimes 10 years to reverse it. So let's see, personal security, security possessions, we, we call the employee security, customer security. So customer security, uh, in, in, in every store almost, you see some cleaning stations, right? Is, is that about security too, like safety? Yeah. If, if, it, if, if someone breaks the Coca-Cola or, champagne wine or something like that then somebody needs to come quickly and clean it right so clean it clean the mess because someone can slip and then fall and then sue Walmart, right so they gotta they gotta clean it 
so it's about safety of uh, the customers as well, right? Company assets, sure. What about your personal information security? Is that a, an asset too for the company? Uh, it's a company asset too. Uh, some companies just sell it, <laughs> okay? <laughs> they get the information, they sell your information without saying it's yours, right? Uh, without saying it's yours. Uh, there's a lot of good tricks how to do that. But uh, do you have any publicly available information of yourself? Any information, any publicly available information? Is any of your information public? LinkedIn, yeah, it's public, right? It's public. But guess what? Who can do anything with LinkedIn, right, Dan? Is it, is it dangerous for you? Do you, are you worried about the data there? Air, air tags, air tags, yeah. It, people put it in your cars, under your cars or somewhere in the cars, and they, they can follow you. And they can do all kinds of malicious activities with this if they want. Social media, publicly available information, but what kind of information makes you worried about, about the cybersecurity in your social media? Right. It makes you vulnerable instantly especially for a little bit clever and someone that's clever who's clever and has a little bit of bad intentions you are instantly vulnerable it's it's more scary than some of us think okay you you have to balance but if most of us i know they just have an account they don't post anything they just <clears throat> receive a feed right they just check their news and stuff like that that's that's better, uh, but from a time management perspective, depending on the personality type, it it consumes it depletes your time available for for development and other stuff for your family and work and expertise. Okay. Okay. So I don't know if you are doing it intentionally or not, but when you're posting photos on social media. When you're posting videos on social media, and, and this includes LinkedIn and YouTube and anything like that, live broadcast over social media. Even emails. When you send an email with attachments, right? When you receive emails with attachments, when you accept cookies, right? Almost any website says, hey, accept cookies, and then you accept them, and you don't even know what you accept. Accept rules and policies that are written like this little, right? And then you accept them and, and they wrote there, your data will be shared with third parties without telling it's you, right? That's why when you travel with, with Google Maps, when you're turning the corner where there's a McDonald's and it's noontime, lunchtime, they will quickly give an advertisement, hey, you know, a park in here. There's a McDonald's, go get a burger, right? Or if the Starbucks, go get a Starbucks. If it's a movie theater, hey, there's a movie, there's a show going on. Why don't you park and go, right? So you accept all these rules, but you're not even aware. But you don't need to be aware. Just know that your data is taken, is kept, is stored, and it's sold and shared, okay? Sold and share and some of these companies are basically have the same parent company right uh and then you see they keep changing names uh they have a parent company so whichever it doesn't matter they all go to the same same company so they share information with each other almost within the same company they even share with the third party companies so they make more money more money okay i, I love your location right location uh, I want you to test it. Whenever we talk something at dinner table in my, with my family, then, then we open up YouTube from someone's phone or Google something. The first ad is always what we talked about. They are even listening to us, not only like navigation, like GPS location or whatever we type. Whatever we say is also stored. Have you realized that before? For example, we, we were talking about uh, some movies, right, coming up. And then when you open, the first thing is that movie. They are listening to us. It's 
it's incredible. It's unbelievable. And I don't want to also talk about the cameras because that's more scary, right? Uh, that's why I have this little thing over my laptop. Look at this. I just close it. This is a physical thing, right? I close it. I open it from physical. It's a physical thing. They can't open it up from a distance, okay? But my phone, I can't really do that. So my phone is vulnerable. Uh, that's why sometimes I put it like face down. Well, there's a back camera too. Yeah, there's not much you can do really. Okay, so be aware of those, okay? When you click links, attachment, open pictures in the emails. If you're not expecting that email, uh, don't open it. Always call the person and then verify if they sent the email. I'm very picky on this, okay? That's why one of the tools that I want you to get a habit, right? Keep, make it a habit. And then don't combine, don't give out information that some people can look at it and then they combine, analyze it, and then come up with an information or a knowledge. Like you are in flow. Don't make them, uh, don't get them know that information with putting little pieces together like a puzzle. You think that you posted one thing on Instagram and another one on YouTube and another one on LinkedIn, but someone following you and who knows that those three accounts is yours, they will combine that information as a puzzle and then they will come up with the conclusion that one is at home, let's go break in, right? So for example, one tool is, uh, I want to make a little uh, exercise here. For example, you saw this on my on my desk, right? In my office, on my cubicle. You saw this on a on a post-it note, like a yellow post-it, post notes. What is, what is this? That's a data, right? That's a data. What do you think this is? This may be, let's say you are a bad intentional person and you're looking for some things about me, right? To come up with, you know, something bad that can hurt me. Uh, what do you think this? Pin number? Excellent. Really good. This may be a pin number. What else? Appointment time with my doctor, right? Uh, can it be an address? Just the house number? House, right? Or office, right? What else can it be? Think of this like you posted something on one of your social media, right? 1010. 10. Or someone posted, found that post note on your desk when you were away for lunch. And then they get this. How about my bank account? Or last for my social security. That's scary, right? Oh my goodness, that's, that's bad. Can it be a birthday? 1010. 10. How about uh, dollars in my account? We can come up with probably 10 more. Or if we think like five minutes more, we can come up 24. But uh, does that help for the bad intention guy? It's, it's not really, not much, right? So let's put it this way. And same day or later, right? They found something like this this time 10 10 10 south uh mill drive how about that one let's let's think of this as a post-it okay how about that one what what can this be now is it a pin number let's 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 eliminate that we don't think it is is it a pin number probably not is it an appointment with the, with my doctor? Maybe, because it's an address, right? Can it be my classes? Probably not, right? Address, house, office? Probably. Bank account? No. Last for my SSN? No. Can it be a birthday? No. Can it be my balance? No. Did you see that? We drew, we, we, we look from how many alternatives? Like 10 alternatives, we brought it down to two options. Right? It's an address, but just we don't know 
when and what. So we are still not sure. But if I add or see another post-it or, or a post-it, and the reason is you don't want people to get to the information level, get to the knowledge level, get to the wisdom level about you and your behaviors and about your life and about your confidential personal information. So when you put context into data, now you have information. For example, it was one, it was 10, 10, right? And we had 25 options and we can't really do anything, right? But when you put it in context and see South Mill Avenue, then it becomes an information which is more organized, more useful for, for me, right? To do something bad about it and knowledge and wisdom. If I know you always go to lunch with someone in the same restaurant almost every day or every Friday, now I have the wisdom to keep track of you. I know what you're doing on Friday lunchtime. Where are you eating at what restaurant and with whom, right? So that's now a wisdom level. So data will not really help them, but a lot of little data, right? Like I showed you, when they put the puzzle together, it'll become an information and then a knowledge. And now with a wisdom, if you have wisdom, you can action, right? You can action. There's patterns. In July, his house is empty. So now I have this wisdom, I can do whatever I want, right? So try to keep everything in data and keep them separately. And then don't let others move up to the information level, move up to the knowledge level, and then move up to the wisdom level. You're not yet. That's good. Guess what? So we purchased uh, a phone number from one company to just, just uh, three weeks ago, I believe. The moment we purchased that, the next day, real estate agent started, it's just one day old number. Well, supposedly, maybe it's used with someone else before and closed down. I don't know. They started asking him if they want to sell that house. Got that number. I don't, it's unbelievable. It's unbelievably high. Companies share information because they get a lot of a lot more revenue when they share. Okay, so keep it in the data level. Okay, who else knows you other than you? Anyone who looks up your accounts, they know that it's you, and they can bring the pieces of the puzzle together. Do you know white pages? Did you look it up? White pages, U.S. phone book. Do you know these pages? Smart background checks. I urge you to check these websites if you didn't know this before. And there's a couple more. I was surprised uh, whenever, whenever you try to apply a job, they always want a security check, right? I mean, background check. And most of the applications wants you to list down your last 10 years physical home address, right? What I do, I, I go in the internet. And then I find my addresses. It's there. I don't even know it, but it's there. And sometimes companies send you links, right? Hey, they, they are mostly have agreement with the third party. And then that third party sends you a link with the background check. And then you choose the right answer, right? They ask you like, what is your first address, house number? They say, what is your, the first rental? So they, they do all this kind of like, which university did you attend, right? And then they have, how do they know? How do these guys know they test me on what I did? <laughs> and that's called a background check. It's unbelievable how they get this information and how they store them and how they use them, right? Go check these websites. Uh, truly a realtor, sure, they will know of your... Uh, house number, house address, how much did you buy it, how much did you sell it, what's the square footage, what is the text on your property, who is your homeowners association director, uh, how many rooms, all this kind of stuff, right? They have pictures from top, bottom, wherever. Uh, if someone wants to use it, you know, to break in, hey, do they have windows in the, back, in the backyard? 
to how can how can I get in the back back backyard, right? Do they have walls like the fence that I can like jump over? All this kind of stuff is out there. If someone wants to do something with your house, it's there. So some of the other techniques, right? Probably you heard phishing, wishing, and ransomware. Okay. Uh, I'm not going to play the video here, but have you heard phishing? It's usually with emails or websites, right? You get an email, there's a link, and they tell you there's a great vacation in Florida, in, in LA, San Diego, New York, one week, $700. It's unbelievably, it's too good to be true that they say, right? And then you, you, you attracted to it and then you click the link and they bring you to a website that looks really perfect and real, but it's not. It's just getting your information, right? So that's phishing, okay? Anything too good to be true, like one week vacation, $200. It's, it's not. It's, it's fake, okay? So that's called phishing. And it's like phishing, but it's with a PH, okay? That's just phishing. Uh, this happens very frequently. This happens very frequently. Uh, most of the time, you don't even realize it. Vishing. What is vishing? It's voice phishing, okay? Phishing, it was website and email. This is by phone. Voice phishing, it became vishing, okay? So it's mostly by, done by phone. Get tricked with this because I'll hang up, I'll do this and that. But we usually get tricked with this, okay? And the reason is we are in a rush. We don't think about it for a second time. Uh, life is hectic. Maybe you were expecting a package. You were expecting something to happen. So you quickly you know, trap in it. You could be trapping it. And have you heard ransomware? Did this happen to anyone? Ransomware basically one day, so you open it up and it's black. And it has a bank account number or a phone number. And they, they say, please call us. Or they just say, put $10 into this account or put $50 into an account. And then they will unlock your computer. You, you just... It doesn't help turning on, turning off. You throw it out of the window, it doesn't help. You just need to get that $10 in that bank account, right? That's called ransomware. Is that a big problem, dear student? Is it a big problem? You just put in $10 and then they will open it up. Where can it be a big problem? This can be a big problem if you are in a hospital. If you are the owner of the hospital, or the chief chief health officer of a hospital, and then one day your server is not opening up, your computers are not opening up, and you have ten patients connected to computers. Right? That's a that's a big thing. That's a big thing. And in that case, they will ask for ten thousand dollar, a hundred thousand dollar, because they know your hospital and that computer you need it. You know, it doesn't matter. And it's, uh, the amount is really low, so you can just put in $5, $10, whatever they say, that's fine. And they will never say 10000 or a 1000 even for, for a student because they, they target tens of thousands of students. If every one of you put in $10, it'll make a lot of money for them. But the, it, because it's focused and targeted for a hospital, they know they are targeting the hospital and they have patients, then they will ask more money. They are very honest. So what they do, if you put in the money, they will open up back your computer, right? Because all they want is money. So when you put in the money, $10, they will open it up. And, and you will not lose any data. Why do they open up back again when you put in $10? Well, it's not only you. Students are putting in $10. It's great, a lot of money. And then they also want to be... Uh, be Trust, trustable agent because next time when it happens, you quickly will put in $10 because you know they're going to open it up, right? So they want you to trust them to open it up. It's not like a regular scam, right? They open it up. 
they are very professional ransomware. Okay. One day, if you open up your computer and there's a message saying "call us" or putting this this money uh, this much money into this account, remember it's a ransomware. Okay. You cannot get rid of it throwing your throwing your computer out of your window. Okay. And there are some hackers of the hackers. But this is actually fun, but I want to spend some time on my personal story, okay? So during COVID, everyone was at home. She was always like at home and I was at home, but working. My kids were online school. They were not going anywhere. And one day, one day I went to shopping. And then those days we only shop, like try to shop once a week, right? Like to get the, to be less exposed to COVID-19 germs. So. One day I shopped and then came back. And then there was a paper sticked on my door. This is our second delivery attempt. And that's why we're uh, leaving this note here. Uh, please call us blah, 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 this number. And I took it and then I walked in the house and I started thinking, okay, what is this paper now? Let's, let's look at what it is. So it was saying it, this is the second attempt, <clears throat> but I was really surprised because everyone is at home, right? If they ring the bell, someone will, will be out. So I, I really didn't believe that it was their second attempt, right? Because we were not aware of the first attempt. And if, and the second thing is, why don't you leave the paper in the first attempt if you want me to call, right? What they want to do is they want to rush us, okay? In in those kind of hacking, hackings and social engineering and all this kind of stuff, they want to rush you. They want to, they want to think that's something urgent. There's something important and they want to rush you. Okay. Not to think through, not, to, not to think rationally, not expecting anything. And then <clears throat> I, I started looking at the phone number. Well, that's a regular phone number, but I looked at the company. It's not USPS. It's not FedEx. It's not Amazon. What else out there? It's, it's not these big companies like we, we always work. So I said, okay, there's not even a company name. <laughs> okay. It was really strange. And they said, call this number and there's a code there. Whoever answers your phone, give this code to him, her, and then we'll take care of it. And I said, okay, usually these guys after second attempt, they give an address and they want you to come to them. They don't want, they don't want to employ someone who will receive calls, right? They want you to come to their location and then get the box, right? It was not saying that as well. I was really, really suspicious. Uh, so what happened is I decided to call, but I was cautious, okay? I, I just wanted to test. So I called them, and then there was really someone answering a lady, but I believe it's not from US. So I was barely able to understand what she's saying, but she was saying, uh, so I, I said, okay, I got a, I received a code on my door, like a paper on my door. And that's the reason I'm calling. And then the, she started saying, Hey, is this, uh, is your number <clears throat> this and this and that? She's telling me the digits. And I said, <clears throat> don't you already see my number? She said, Oh, no, no, no. This is like a standard procedure. We need to, we need to ask our customers. Okay. I said, which company are you? She said, uh, whatever, ABC, but I don't know. I said, don't you have a location? I want to come pick up, pick up my box. And she said, Oh, no, no, no. We work like online, whatever. We don't have a location. Okay. What do you want to do? And she said, uh, can you please, uh, verify that your name is okay? Yeah. That's my name. And then she said, uh, can you verify your cell phone is this and that? I said again, look, I'm already calling from, from, from my phone. Are you not seeing that? She said, Oh no, we, you know, our system is different, whatever, whatever, all kinds of excuses. And then, uh, I said, uh, okay, that's my number. And then, and then she went ahead and said, okay, uh, so what I will do. And I said, okay, what is the package? Give me some information about the package. She said, Oh no, we're not allowed to give any information about. I said, is it a big one? Is it a, like a paper? Is it an envelope? What is it? She said, Oh, oh no, we don't know. And she said, uh, so what we will do is I'm going to send you a link as text. And then I will ask you to click that link on your text and then uh, still on the phone, by the way, and then putting that code on your paper into that link. 
and then it will open up my window, my window over here, and then uh, then I will I will ask you something else. Okay, I said I'm not gonna do that, and then uh, I hung up, and then they never called me. I never received another attempt, and I didn't have a box. Okay, but what I wanted to do at that time is just to see like how complex is this thing is. All right. So it's involving, it involves a person, right? So there is someone employed by that company, like hacker company. He's coming in my door and sticking the, sticking this physical paper on my door, right? So there is someone, there is someone in the IT space, IC domain that keeps track of these numbers, people and all this data, right? There is someone there. And there's a lady on the other side of the globe answering my phone. Uh, can you believe this? And someone is uh, preparing this paper and understanding that if I say first attempt, they're not going to rush. So we should say second attempt so they can just rush and do something uh, irrational, right? Like in a hurry. And then I, I never received anything, okay? And they never called me. If they were a professional company, they will not leave me alone. They will bring my, they would have brought my box, but there was no box. I, I, I am certain there was no box, right? But if something happened, if they gathered my information, uh, I don't know, maybe they will compromise my phone. Maybe they were just able to bring all my data together and make it to a knowledge or information so that they can use it next, in next steps, whatever it may be, right? Uh, but I didn't let them do that. But it's, it's more than, it's more complex than we did. There is a huge network of people, of IT, of phone, of physical people bringing boxes, like the papers on your doors. So there are people working on your information, gathering that information. It's, it's more than you think. It's, it's huge. It's huge. It's complex. So always think twice when you're clicking on something, okay? So that's what happened to me. It's it's really mixed. It's really hybrid. It's 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 difficult to combat with these guys, okay? Sure. So protect yourself and your business and your projects, right? Uh, what you have on web, be careful, right? Think twice before you click. Think twice before you post. Think twice. Before you share anything, think twice before you download anything. Even it's coming from from someone in your company that, but you're not expecting because they deface people, right? Now I want you to be at least be aware of the risks uh, because we covered them, right? And then you can do whatever you wanna. You, you can choose whatever you wanna do, okay? But please be careful. Please be, and then I told you my personal story as well. And thank you.